Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I'm just going to give it one more moment, see if a couple more people are going to join. We've got quite a few already. All right. It's great to see such a fantastic turnout. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Morgan Sieg. I'm one of the co-conveners of this session. And can everybody hear me? I'm gonna assume that everybody can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all to this workshop with a brief introduction. As you may know, this workshop is part of session 45, which is a two-part session on inclusive collaborations in Antarctic research. And last week on the 30th of July, we held the first part of this session, which was a series of oral presentations and posters that were sharing new academic work, as well as the work of practitioners in the field. Uh, we're gonna hear the last few of those presentations in just a few minutes. And if you weren't able to join us for the first part of this session uh, last week, then I really encourage you to take a look at the recordings, which I think should become available on the SCAR YouTube channel really soon. So today's workshop, which we're all here for now, is uh, was planned as the second part of session 45. And the idea is to include a much wider range of voices in this discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion in Antarctic research. And so we're very much hoping that all of you will take this opportunity to share your priorities, your concerns, and all of your ideas throughout the next few hours. And before I hand things over to our lead convener, Ikra Chowdhury, I'd like to thank all of our co-conveners. That's Ikra, Renuka Bade, Alexander Thornton, Donna Freider, and Meredith Nash, who've done a fantastic job planning this session. And I'd also like to thank them for taking on even more responsibilities when I went on maternity leave earlier this summer. So thank you all very much for that. And in that vein, I think we should recognize that the virtual format of this year's conference has its own inclusivity implications. And I know we're all really eager to get back to gathering in person and having these conferences face-to-face uh, -face. But it's worth acknowledging that this virtual platform makes it possible for more members of our community to participate even if they have limited mobility or financial limitations. So we'd like to uh, say a big thank you to SCAR for making this possible. And that same spirit of open-minded innovation, of rethinking our normal operations in a way that broadens participation is something I think we need to insist on continuing. We've all heard calls from around the world and not least from the Black Lives Matter movement coming out of the US that when we come out the other end of this COVID-19 pandemic, we can't just return to normal. We have to create a new and more equitable normal. And that same thing goes for the Antarctic community. We're being forced to rethink the way that we do things. And this is the time for us to take a leap forward toward a new and more inclusive normal in Antarctic research. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from all of you about how we can get there over the next few hours. Please do participate throughout the discussions. And thank you all again so much for joining us. I'll turn it over to Ikra. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm just looking at the amount of participants we've got already and I am just astounded. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna pick up where Morgan left off. Uh, I get to deliver some housekeeping. So we really encourage everybody to use the live Q&A function during today's session. There'll be panel discussions uh, where we would really welcome your questions and your comments. Um, we are then going to have a couple of breakout discussions um, one of which will be facilitated by myself and one which will be facilitated by another member of the convening team, Alex Thornton. So during that session, we really encourage that you use the live Q&A functions. We'll be uh, having several polls as well, so please do engage with those too. Um, and that will be our main um, way of having that discussion with you. Uh, so please do engage because uh, we really want to hear from you and get as many perspectives as possible. Uh, beyond that, just um, thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, and I think we'll begin our oral and poster presentation. So I would like to invite Jilda to share your screen and to kick off our, uh, our poster presentations for today. Um, thank you, Ikra. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce to all of you um, 
the Camlar Scholarship. I'm here um, at the place of Davide, who wasn't able to make it to this session. I know many of you may have heard of this opportunity before, um, but this is sort of a public service announcement that we, as the latest batch of scholarship holders, wanted to express to the rest of the community, as well as um, tell about what the scholarship has done in its past 10 years of existence. Um, so, of course, in three minutes, I won't get into too much detail. Um, this poster, as well as a slide slideshow with all of the testimonials that we collected from former scholarship holders are available online that you can look for that on the contributors, the contributions from authors section. But essentially, uh, the idea is that CAMLAR, which is the Convention for the Conservation of um, Antarctic Marine Living Resources, uh, manages the uh, all of the different fisheries uh, that exist in the Southern Ocean. And it's an international organization that turns science into policy decisions to manage the Southern Ocean. And the idea of the scholarship is to provide an opportunity for early career research early career researchers to get involved in that decision making process. That process takes place over meetings, mainly once a year, as well as working group meetings uh, during the intercession. And so the scholarship essentially provides travel funds for early career scientists to make it to those meetings, which are often in Hobart and other parts of the world for the working groups. Um, but something that the scholarship provides, which I, for example, when I applied, wasn't thinking so much about that, is the mentor capacity. So you have to pick a mentor mentor um, who's any member uh, that's active in, in CAMLAR to um, support your application. And they essentially provide you with all of the information you need to in answering all of your silly questions about what CAMLAR is about. And so it really facilitates your involvement um, in the organization. And what the scholarship um, aims to do, um, and this is where it is the inclusion part, is it tries to bring in different um, ECRs, early career researchers, from different countries that are involved in, the, in CAMLAR as a whole. As you can see in the box down here, and if you check out the presentation later, it'll be more clear, um, there's almost no country repeated twice. They really try to bring in early career researchers from many different parts of the CAMLAR family to get involved in the process. And this not only helps to increase engagement from all member countries in CAMLAR, but as well tries to improve the ways in which we have early career researchers involved in CAMLAR meetings and CAMLAR decisions and sort of preparing the next generation of people that will be involved in CAMLAR. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it at that pretty much and also just to let you guys know, this was the idea of us as the scholarship holders to put this uh, presentation together. We got in touch with the secretariat to do that. They didn't say, oh, guys, can you tell everyone what a great job we're doing? No, we really felt as the scholarship holders that this was such a great opportunity and more people should know about it. So please feel free to check out the materials online. And thank you so much for the time. Uh, thank you so much, Gilda. Um, that was Fantastic. Um, and I think it speaks uh, volumes that you guys decided to put that together off your own back. So um, I would like to now invite the audience, if you guys have any questions for Jilda, please do pop them in the live Q&A and um, we'll reload those over right now. Um, if not, uh, we are happy to move over to our second presenter. So I'd like to invite Donna, who's a member of the convening team, uh, to deliver her presentation next. Donna, if you'd like to, oh, we have a question. So um, a question for you, uh, Gilda, do you have to work on a specific topic to be eligible for the scheme? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ikra. Um, hope you've got my slides up there. Wonderful, Donna, take it away. In humans, in polar science, because when I started my role, I had someone ask me if I was studying diversity and if it was humans and not one of the fantastic creatures from our polar science regions. Um, I'm a geologist by background and have been lucky enough to get to Antarctica as well as working across Australia, um, the Pacific and across Africa. Um, I'm in this conversation because I love science and uh, I think science and research should be available to everyone. We're here today to discuss the fact that we have an issue regarding diversity and inclusion in polar science. And if we have the lack of diversity in any research sector, I think it's an issue. But to have a lack of diversity in the sector that is studying the polar regions, which is at this time 
perhaps the most critical region in the globe and in the globe's history, then I think we have a critical social issue and a science issue. We're looking at improving diversity because diversity increases innovation, diversity increases responsibility, and diversity increases the social ownership and social equality of the science that we find. There may not be a typical STEM job out there, but we do know that right now there is a STEM stereotype for polar science. And when we think of a typical polar scientist and when society thinks of that, we are finding that we have a stereotype of a white male. This stereotype severely impacts the people who are looking to come into polar science and the people who are going to connect with polar science and who are going to help us find the solutions as we move forward. If the collectors of the people, if the collectors of those who are looking at our polls for science, if they are a very narrow sector of our society, we're also going to have trouble connecting in with all the people we want to hear our message, all the people we want to listen to our science. And that is another problem. I'm here working on a diversity in polar science initiative, which was funded by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. We wanted to celebrate existing diversity, but also take an important step forward to look at opportunities of how do we attract the underrepresented groups, including women, people from BAME, which is black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, as well as LGBTQ and people with disability. How do we attract them into science? How do we attract them into polar science particularly? And we've got a couple of projects that have been working on so that we can reach out into those underrepresented populations and get them to understand what polar science is and the opportunities that it could bring. We started this work by actually looking at our current situation. We looked at our statistics of the UK polar research community and we found that we are only 3% BAME researchers inside the UK polar research landscape, whereas the percentage of BAME students across UK higher education and across UK society is at around 16%. So we can see that we have an issue and that we needed to recognise that and we need to do something about it. So we've reached a, not only a starting point, but we've started looking at some positive inclusion projects and we've had a couple in the last six months. Uh, the first one was a Seals from Space citizen science project that helped one of our PhD candidates at the British Antarctic Survey. And we were able to tap into underrepresented students and get them to come and help and have a look at what polar science could be. We had a second project, which was Polar Horizons, and we had some fantastic students from, again, those underrepresented groups come in to the British Antarctic Survey to shadow with scientists who were going to host them for a week and help them understand what polar science could be inside their STEM backgrounds. We have had a bit of impact from COVID, but we are keeping that network going and making sure we're keeping in contact with those students because we want to prove that you have to go along non-traditional paths to get the underrepresented students. So that polar science initiative uh, is looking to promote polar science into these groups, but also to work with funding bodies, work with universities to understand what is going on out there at the moment and how we can help to improve diversity.
there is a question of why we're getting these this traction now. And um, as Morgan mentioned, the Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement have changed society's level of tolerance. And I think science is in exactly the right place to benefit from change. We need to look at our field trips and how diversity and inclusion is an important part of safety. And we need to, we were lucky that last week we had the first conference discussion that included both Arctic and Antarctic discussion about inclusion and diversity. And I think we're definitely getting a lot of movement uh, on this conversation right now. And really what next and how can we help? If there is a diversity movement in your organization, I'd like you to join it. If not, talk about starting one. If you can, connect in with your EDI champions. Mentor, mentor up into your leadership about diversity and about inclusion. You can suggest activities to our initiative or to other initiatives and organisations. You can inspire students by presenting and discussing your research at non-traditional schools. You will have to make an effort to do it, but it will be worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Ikra. Uh, thank you so much, Donna. Um, so we've got some questions for you already. Um, for those who've asked Gilda questions previously, um, Gilda's managed to answer them on, uh, on air. So um, if you've got any more questions, please do keep them coming in. So Donna, one of the questions that you've got is, do the students develop long-term engagement with polar science or do they just participate in the activity and then move on? Um, so I think that's to do with the first initiative that you mentioned, but also possibly Polar Horizons. I think it's actually both at this stage. We're, we're a project that's been going for six months. Uh, we're looking to engage students on the on long term, but right now we have had some short term projects. Uh, our long term uh, influence hopefully will also come with resources that we can provide for wider student groups. And we're looking to engage in with those funding partners and with universities to make sure that we create a rolling system of connection with polar science. We don't just want this to be one off. We're looking at how we can do a Polar Horizons 2 and it will be more online, which I think uh, as Morgan said as well, it's a fantastic opportunity to really stretch into society and, and contact people who you know, we can't contact face to face. So ideally we are looking to grab these students and keep them in polar science, yeah. Uh, wonderful, another question uh, that we've got is, uh, what is your favourite part of being involved with the Polar Horizons project? I was probably asked by one of the students and I'd say my answer is definitely the connection in with these amazing young STEM professionals. Uh, they have extraordinary experience coming from so many different sectors of our society and the energy they bring and the reflection they bring from having a different upbringing and from having a different view on what science could be for them and what science should be for society. When we are putting so much money into finding this information at, at either pole, what should it be uh, developing and, and delivering for, for people in society? So I get so much energy uh, from the students and they are the best thing about it. Amazing. Um, so this is uh, the question that seems to be gaining the most traction. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask this one next. Do you have any recommendations on how to increase the involvement of people with disabilities in, in polar networks? That's a great question. Um, we had some of our students who attended uh, do identify as having a disability. And one of their comments was that the current COVID crisis has changed people's perception of how you can do science, where you can do science, how resources can be sent out to people. You know, people are much more willing to send information than perhaps they were. They would have hold it on a certain hard drive and not let it go. Right now, we have the ability to send that information to people so that they do not have to go out into the field. They do not have to, to journey around the globe. 
to get information or to have that partnership with people. Uh, these Zoom tools and, and other uh, networking tools have really made a difference for how people with disability can share science and talk science. And it also helps with the tools with people who have sight issues or, or um, other communication issues that there are tools there that electronically you can get that research back and forth between people. So I think we should be embracing a process that helps people with disabilities to apply for our, for our doctorates and our postdoc roles, because I think they are more than capable of joining us in, in this scientific journey now. Uh, wonderful, we've got some more questions still. So um, I'll ask the, the next one that's risen to the top, which is what is your top recommendation for polar research organizations to do to increase diversity and inclusion? Well, that's a very good question and one we're working on for 12 to 18 months. But um, I think there's a few key things. A, a top-down message, leadership leading the way. If you have that message and you have uh, a cultural drive towards diversity and inclusion, then you will get change. You also need to support the people in your organisation who may be from that underrepresented group because they have to be able to perform at their best. They need to be able to bring their whole selves. You need support for your LGBTQ researchers. You need support for your disabled people so that they can do the work at their highest level. You need people who, who are underrepresented with, um, with a race that they feel comfortable in their workplace. And if they are the minority, how do we make them feel comfortable? How do we talk to them about any issues they have? And how do we make them comfortable so that they can bring their full selves into their science and their research as well? So I think if you cover those two grounds, that's where you're gonna get a lot of traction. Um, right, there's uh, just a, a couple of questions left. So I'll group those together. And then after that, I think we'll have to move on to the next presentation. I think we could talk about this for, for the rest of the workshop, but we've got a very tight schedule. So uh, the last few questions we've got is um, one saying that, the, that they appreciate the efforts at increasing inclusivity, but could you comment on perhaps the place of merit in producing the best polar research globally? Uh, another question asks, uh, what's most surprised you during your work with the Polar Horizons project? And, um, and then there's a comment, um, more of a thought, uh, saying that perhaps one of the ways towards inclusivity uh, to, for people who are disabled or who uh, identify as having a disability is to also have a person communicating in sign language. Um, so yeah, just if you'd just like to, to answer those in one group. And then move on. <laughs> well, it's very true. If, if we'd have, um, Hopefully there's transcript technology that we could have had a written transcript here for, for people or for, for sign language. That's definitely something. And as we have our conferences and are face to face, that's definitely something we need to make sure we're including, as well as the physical uh, access for, for everybody. Things that surprise me. Um, Actually, a very good positive thing that surprised me is that the, the change of the people who are having this conversation now. In past years where you've had an issues such as that that created the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the, the conversation has been with those who are impacted. And right now, there are a lot of people having the conversation who are allies, who want to see a change and who know a change would help science and help research. And that brings me to the first one, which is about merit. Let me tell you that there are systemic barriers that stop everyone who wants to get involved in science, getting involved in science. So right now, you are only getting a pool of people who are filtered through that system. You are not getting the best scientists you could get. You are not getting the best people who are gonna fight for that innovation who are going to bring an experience beyond our understanding to science. So we need to break down those systemic barriers to actually get you the pool of scientists that you deserve to create the research and to create the answers that we need in this planet moving forward. Uh, thank you so much, Donna. So um, now I guess I get to introduce myself. Um, so <laughs> I will stop sharing my screen. and. Uh, the 
a presentation that I will be delivering. Uh, Don, if you uh, are done sharing your screen, I should be able to share mine next. Um, so the presentation that I'd like to deliver is one which uh, focuses on a paper uh, that was written by myself and two of the other conveners of this session, um, Morgan and Renuka. And if you just bear with me. Um, Donna, I think I might, oh, fantastic. So. Can everyone see that okay? Let me see if I can start this slideshow. Bear with me. Don't want to be doing that. There we go. Um, so the this paper, uh, in many ways, kind of uh, provided the impetus for this workshop and the session that we had last week, uh, where Morgan Renuka and I um, basically were asked to contribute to the special uh, edition of Polar Record, which looked at women in polar science, women in polar research, and we decided to to write an op-ed on um, bringing a, a theoretical framework that we were all fairly familiar with into polar research. Um, so without further ado, I'll just go into the sort of main points that we made. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to bring in this concept of intersectionality. Bear with me. I'm trying to figure out how to... Uh... Let's go forward in my presentation. I had to use arrow buttons, Ikra, on my Yeah, keyboard. I've been trying to use this arrow button. It's just not having any of it. Bear with me. Um, I'll see if I can uh, try this again. Sorry, I'll just pause this share for a second. Uh, um, we'll, we'll just try again. When in doubt. Um, there we go. I think, I think this ought to work now. Nope. In that case, I think I can just, uh, I'll stop screen sharing and I think I will just It's just not having any of it, but with me. Apologies. There we go. Um, I think it might just be best for me to just deliver this as an oral presentation. Uh, I did have visual cues um, for which I do apologize. I'm just uh, clearly not as technically able as I thought I was when I practiced this this morning. Um, so when we talk about intersectionality, the concept of intersectionality, it was something that was coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a pioneer in critical race theory uh, in the United States. Um, she had basically um, come up with this concept, uh, this, this framework, this approach to, to issues as a legal scholar in 1989, um, after a very specific case um, went into sort of uh, legal consideration. And it was a case of a black woman who had applied for a job at a factory to work within the admin office. And she was denied um, uh, employment on the basis of her race. Um, and she was told that uh, only white women could work in the office. And so she took that discrimination uh, case forward, um, tried to uh, have access to legal recourse and was told that because the company in question did hire black people, but as factory workers, black men specifically, that there was no discrimination happening. And, um, and what that case illustrated for Professor Crenshaw and for, for those of us who have read her work was that basically, um, there are moments in which uh, several facets of someone's identity, uh, be that in this case it was race and gender together, um, put them in a place where there was no description of their experience in the legal um, 
uh, literature and also no access to legal recourse because um, if that person was looking at gender uh, as a protected characteristic in a legal uh, argument, there were people who were identified as women who were working in that factory. And so there wasn't any discrimination happening on the basis of gender. If that person wanted to access legal recourse on the basis of discrimination um, about race, there was no access to recourse because there were black people working in that space. And so what Professor Crenshaw had done in this study was be able to identify that the experience of black women was doubly compounded and also led to um, this question of, of when intersectionality exists, when there are multiple identities, um, those people can actually fall through the cracks when it comes to discrimination, when it comes to their experiences not being recognized. And she focuses specifically on civil rights law in her work. But the fantastic thing about intersectionality as a framework to approach issues is that it has been moved from not just the legal discourse, but also into feminist discourse more widely. Fourth wave feminism has really um, uh, embraced uh, Dr. Crenshaw's work. And the fantastic thing about that is that we can then use that as a framework to do so much more than just um, than just looking at uh, sort of discrimination more widely. And when we do that, we can apply it to fields such as our own. So the amazing thing is this framework is being used uh, by scholars already. Uh, we saw that in the session that we had last week, um, I'd like to point specifically to the work being done by um, Dr. Meredith Nash and uh, Dr. Hannah Nielsen, who were talking specifically about um, sexual harassment in the field. Um, we know that when we talk about women um, in polar research, like when the work done by organizations such as Women in Polar Science uh, highlights the experiences of women from across the world. And so what we wanted to do in that paper was to basically say, it's fantastic that we're starting to talk about having women more involved in polar research at all levels, but we need to think beyond what the term woman means. We need to bring an intersectional approach to this. Um, and by doing so, you know, we can't just say, oh, well, we have some women involved. Um, isn't that fantastic? We needed to think beyond that to think, uh, do we have women from different racial backgrounds, from different uh, backgrounds in terms of social class and, and backgrounds in terms of wealth? Do we have women represented from the global south? Do we have women whose first language isn't necessarily English who might be working in a different language? Um, do we have women represented who are of those with caring responsibilities, whether they're parents or if they have other caring responsibilities, do we have disabled women? And so basically what we want to, wanted to do with that paper and more widely is to ask people to complicate the narrative, to ask uncomfortable conversation, to have, have uncomfortable conversations in the workplace and to ask uncomfortable questions of themselves when it comes to issues of diversity and inclusion. Because I think sometimes it's very, very easy to, um, to kind of have uh, these initiatives where you have a clear goal in mind, which is to have more women in the workplace or to have more folks from uh, minority ethnic backgrounds uh, in the workplace in whatever um, country you might be working from. And I think uh, one of the things that we did in the paper, and I'd love to go into it, is we had a series of questions uh, that we encouraged folks to to answer or to ask themselves and to ask their institutions as a starting point. And we really saw the paper and also this workshop more widely mm -hmm. as the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Uh, and with that, I think I will end there. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. The paper itself is available, um, open access, and I'm happy to share the link uh, in the Q&A shortly. Um, so, there is a question asking, do Antarctic organizations even understand issues such as intersectionality? I would love to say yes, but I think the answer has to be no in my experience. So I'm a third year PhD student. I can't say that I've been in the Antarctic um, community, the research community for very long. Um, but what I have seen is that 
although people are definitely willing to have conversations and I think in recent months especially that that will to to have these difficult conversations has definitely increased um I think until very recently I don't think people even thought of of inclusivity when it came to things like um understanding the experiences of our queer um members of our community uh, and I, I think we're very much at the start of this conversation and that was one of the reasons why we decided to write this paper because we realized that this is a framework that can really be uh, be used uh, so another question has come in asking what is the best way to start those conversations on a wider scale and can SCAR help I think um, what we're doing here is I hope uh, a way of starting that conversation on a wider scale um, I think the best thing to do is to carry on having these conversations the thing that we wanted as conveners is to um, try and make sure that this isn't just something that happens in a vacuum on its own uh, and we'll chat about it a little bit later in the breakout discussions but there is um, a way of hopefully like carrying on these conversations long after we have this workshop. Uh, I will answer the next two questions that have come in and then I will hand over to the next presenter because I'm aware of uh, how little time we have. Um, so uh, we've asked what practical things can SCAR do to support this conversation? I'm uh, being asked what, how can we avoid uh, preaching to the converted? And based upon the analysis of this topic, what are your suggestions in including a wide range of people? I think um, one of the things that I would say is uh, I, I think SCAR has a, a good good venues for these conversations I would point to the capacity building committee as a good place to start so I think having these conversations within SCAR and knowing that these conversations are happening and being able to to follow what's going on would be really really fantastic in terms of what SCAR can do specifically um how can we avoid preaching to the converted I think it is all about um doing something like this and sort of inviting people as widely as possible one of the things that we discuss is if you're from a marginalized community you really need folks who aren't in the sort of um in the majority to to be willing to listen to learn and then to take action um and I, I will leave it there but thank you so much for your engagement and apologies for the technical difficulties it was bound to happen at some point i'm afraid <laughs> i'd like to invite ranuka now to deliver the final uh, oral presentation for today Uh, thank you, Ikra. Can you actually see my screen? I hope you can. Okay, brilliant. Well, let me just introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Renuka Bade, and a lot of you know me from my uh, normal mode of work, which is uh, working with the European Polar Board. And I used to previously work for SCAR quite a few years ago. But today I'm here in a slightly different capacity. I'm here as um, one of the co-founders of something called the Women in Polar Science Network. Uh, and I'm, I would like to take you a little bit through how we started, what we have done so far, and what our future directions are. So. I hope this works now. Yes, uh, so the broad goal of women in polar science is really to build a strong global network of women researchers and importantly of also of allies of various ages across different disciplines and from all of the geographies around the world. How did we start? It started with a small discussion in 2013 where, um, the four of us uh, that are the co-founders, that's the pictures at the bottom, and that's myself, that's Jess Melbourne Thomas, Marianne Lee, and Justine Shaw. We started having a conversation about how do we, how do we celebrate all of the achievements that have come through uh, with all the different women in, in the polar sciences. And we realized that there was not a huge, um, there's not a way to do this, uh, really well. So we decided to start Women in Polar Science. Just as a network, we uh, started off on a small scale with meetings in, in the SCAR, uh, SCAR conference at uh, in, in New Zealand. And then we 
started off um, using social media, different kinds of social media. We first started on Facebook. We've had quite a few different volunteers over the years. Um, this uh, Women in Polar Science is mainly volunteer driven. So I'd just like to give a quick shout out to Charlotte, Hannah Nielsen, Olivia Lee, Morgan Siag, Adrian Dahoud, and so many other volunteers that have helped us through, through these years. We started small. We started with a little bit of a poster and a Facebook page. Um, we tried to draw in the audience. We saw that there was a huge amount of demand. Um, when we started Twitter, we were quite surprised. We crossed the 3000 mark fairly quickly. And then today we have several different social media channels and overall we are nearly 10,000 strong on, different, on the different platforms. So what have we done so far? We've had, we've had quite a few different events. Um, we did uh, some panel discussions in Malaysia. Uh, at the SCAR conference in Malaysia, we had um, some of the co-founders took part in the Wikibomb event that took part in, uh, that was held in Malaysia. We also had a very interesting and a hugely oversubscribed event in, uh, at SCAR 2018 in Davos. Uh, which is where this event leads from directly. We also have quite a lot of interesting interviews that were done by a commercial uh, videographer who was part of Davos. Uh, they're all available on our Instagram feed. We also did a big Instagram campaign. Uh, this was kicked off at Davos and we highlighted, I think close to 200 women in total now on Instagram just bringing out their stories, sharing the different stories, ensuring that everyone has, uh, you know, people know that there is such a breadth and depth of research uh, carried out, being carried out by women. So these are just some more of the stories there. Uh, and here we are at SCAR 2020. Um, we have this session that's been um, organized by us. Uh, we also had a short session within the SCAR HAS group last week. And hopefully we'll go on to a much more successful uh, discussion later in this session. So just a little bit of a, um, a view, you know, we started this off quite small, just with a little, with, with view to kind of showing off all of the breadth and diversity of women who are doing polar research. And over the last five, six years, We've seen that women in polar science has been hugely recognized in different events, in projects, in so many publications. Um, we've been recognized by SCAR, uh, particularly for the Women in Antarctic Research Wikibomb. We've been recognized by the British Antarctic Survey and their diversity in the UK polar science project that Donna just presented about. We've also been recognized by several other international organizations like 500 Women Scientists, we had gender equality in the Arctic Plan A, Pride and Polar Network, minorities in polar science. And there've also been several publications um, and also masters and PhD dissertations that have talked about women in polar science and its impact. What are the benefits of having such networks? These, these kind of networks increase the representation of uh, representation of women by celebrating and showcasing the breadth of the research that these uh, women do. This promotes diversity and inclusiveness for institutes, for organizations, and for events. And it provides a lot of opportunities for our WIPs to strengthen connections within the network. A lot of times you need, it's, it's a good, it's really good when you see someone like yourself doing the work that you would like to do. So you, you're, you're much more likely to follow them because you have an example. Um, so we are there to inspire a new generation and we are leading by example, hopefully. There's also mentoring and support because polar work, polar work and polar working conditions are very specific. So it's nice to have this network and be able to provide the support for these kind of very specific working conditions. What are our future plans? Uh, we hope to continue collaborations with other networks and ensure that the, the topics of diversity in polar research are kept, are kept going. And we hope to formalize our structure 
uh, including participation in different projects. And also we hope to increase our collaborations with different organizations. And we're going to plan for the future pretty soon. And this will be to ensure that there's a legacy of, of the women in polar science. So I'd like to close my talk with a little message. We hope to continue for many years to come with a shared aspiration for a bright and inclusive future for polar research, supporting a diverse global community of researchers and helping them thrive and achieve the best of their potential. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Renuka. You've got a few questions coming in. I'm just gonna try and group them together for you. Um, so someone's asked, how can I get included and involved in the project? Uh, I think that's a good one to start with. Uh, the first thing is always go and uh, we don't have an official sign up list, but please go and follow our social media. If you'd like to volunteer to do some um, to do some actions, please let us know. And there's always lots of little projects that we can involve you with. Uh, so our, all of, I'll, I'll post the links to all our social media in the chat box so you can follow them. Fantastic. Um, so someone else is asking, women are well represented in early career positions and in leadership. And, you know, there seems to be something going wrong at the mid career management stage. How can that be fixed if you'd like to offer some comments on that? Yeah, so that's the leaky pipeline, isn't it? Um, I think having started this conversation about six, six and a bit years ago now, uh, we've already seen some changes coming into the lower levels. Like Ikra said in the previous presentation, we've started these conversations. Remember about six, seven years ago, there wasn't much talk about diversity. And now we are talking about intersectionality in six years. That's a huge change. So I think we can and hopefully, and I'm the eternal optimist here, we can and will fi fix the leaky pipeline. Just give us a few more years and we'll make sure something is done. Thank you. So the last couple of questions, and I think we'll have to move on to our first panel then, because we are behind time. Um, someone's asking, what's the sort of breakdown when it comes to WIPs between uh, women in the Arctic, women working in the Antarctic? And do you sort of tend to track your engagement? Yeah, so I'll, I'll do them quickly. Um, and the other questions that come in, I'll just answer in the chat box, Ikra, so you can move on. Um, the, the division between Arctic and Antarctic is slightly heavier towards the Antarctic. It's just because the four of us co-founders, three, three of them are purely Antarctic researchers. I'm, I work in both regions, but I've worked quite hard to work with organizations like Women in the Arctic, for example. Um, I was part of their uh, in the, the workshop that they held in Helsinki a couple of years ago. And we've worked with them quite, quite a lot. Uh, so we are trying to redress that balance and ensure that we have both Arctic and Antarctic representation. The last question I'm going to answer on chat, so I will let you move on. Thank you, Ikra. Uh, thank you very much, Renuka. So um, we're a little bit behind time. Um, so I would like to invite uh, Owen, Morgan, Alex and Otto to join me. If you'd like to share your video, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and we can um, we can start our, our first panel. So one of the things that I th thought this panel would be great for doing would be to introduce you guys and the work that you do, uh, and then to have a, a discussion about some of the themes that we'll be talking about throughout. So um, Morgan, if you'd like to introduce yourself and your work first. Everybody, again, uh, I gave the introduction earlier, but I didn't mention what I do. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge at the Scott Polder Research Institute. Uh, most of my research is in the history of science and historical geography. I'm looking um, specifically at how women came to work in greater numbers in Antarctic science over the course of the 20th century, but taking an intersectional lens, um, as Ikra introduced to us and has come up a couple times, trying to look at how um, Antarctic research has become uh, more diverse and more inclusive um, in a number of different, over a number of different axes over time. And I'm uh, part of various networks. I've been involved in APEX for a while, um, collaborating quite a bit with Renuka and Ikra and uh, really happy to be on this panel. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I'd like to invite Owen to introduce yourself and the work that you do. Hi, uh, my name is Owen Griffin. I'm the executive officer at SCAR. And so uh, my role at SCAR is in terms of delivering the schemes for capacity building that we provide. 
Um, and uh, so most of my um, experience is kind of at the sharp end, looking at how these schemes impact people and how we try and review them to improve them year to year. Thank you. Um, Otto, if you'd like to go next. Thank you. I'm Otto Habeck. I'm a social anthropologist based in Hamburg, Germany. And um, uh, on the one hand, I'm uh, uh, involved in the International Arctic Science Committee, I ask, as a member of the uh, Social and Human Working Group. And uh, over the last years, I've been working with colleagues to establish a network called Gender in the Arctic. Uh, we've been starting off from uh, doing research on gender related issues in Siberia. And it has been over the last, I will say, three to four years that uh, there was the impulse and the incentive to reach out to other groups in the circumpolar north. And this SCAR online conference uh, provides the opportunity to link up also with you. Uh, I believe this is a mainly Antarctic based audience, or not based, but uh, Antarctic focused audience. Thank you. Thank you. And Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Thornton. I am an early career researcher and educator based in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Pride and Polar Research and have my own research and consulting business, Polar Ecology LLC. I'm also really involved with groups like Apex and currently an ex officio, having been on the executive committee for a while and really proud to be involved with different groups like SCAR as an early career representative to the CBET. And until this year, I was involved with groups like EGBAM. And I'm really excited to be talking more about diversity issues. Thank you, everyone. So I had like a couple of like softer questions that I was gonna start this discussion with, uh, assuming that we kept a time, but I think some of the discussions that we've had already and some of the questions that we've had, um, I think we can just get straight to it. Um, so. Uh, this is a difficult question and you know uh, if people just want to raise their hands and just jump in. Um, what are the ways that you think that our communities and polar research have failed to include certain folks and um, and what are the pitfalls that you kind of see the uh, research community falling into when kind of attempting to make spaces for marginalized people? If anyone wants to jump in on that. Morgan. I think there are a lot of answers to this question. I'm sure other panelists will have other things to say, um, but I wanna highlight one that I see in a lot of the um, initiatives that I've been a part of, which is that um, Antarctic research is really privileged to be an incredibly collaborative and international uh, endeavor. And yet when we have conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're not terribly international or terribly inclusive, even as we, um, we see an increasing number of networks and initiatives coming up, which are absolutely fantastic and looking at how they're collaborating and, and the intersections between them. Um, these conversations are still pretty dominated by um, Western voices. Uh, they're pretty limited in terms of linguistic diversity. And uh, I think that in part, we're not, at least the initiatives I've been a part of struggle to incorporate, for example, research that's published in languages other than English, which is a, a huge drawback. We're really limited in what we can accomplish if we can't actually converse across linguistic barriers. Um, but also a lot of initiatives are still struggling to achieve real diversity in terms of um, national and ethnic background. And so because of that, I think that we're still, um, we have a long way to go to reconcile differences that might exist in cultural norms, for example, in expectations about um, what diversity, equity, and inclusion should look like, about um, what kinds of behaviors uh, have what kinds of impacts and meanings attached to them. And I hope that that's something we'll, we'll focus on um, increasingly as we move forward. And I'd also really briefly like to reiterate what Donna said um, about um, addressing um, the marginalization of uh, people with different kinds of disabilities. We have a long way to go there. And I think that um, that's one of the things that can come out of the COVID-19 situation, I hope, is as she mentioned, uh, learning to use technologies in more effective ways to be more inclusive, um, but also in thinking about who's represented at our decision-making tables. Because there's no doubt that when you have people who are representative of their own groups um, involved in these conversations and helping to set agendas, that these are the people who are who are experiencing um, 
the barriers and challenging are the one, challenges are the ones who are also most likely to see solutions that the rest of us might not be seeing. So in that respect, we need to work on um, allyship and elevating the voices of the people who are experiencing um, structural inequalities. Owen, yes. Yeah, um, I, I think um, certainly from an organization like SCAR's perspective, when we come across issues, we tend to think about how broadly we approach the community and think, well, we must have within our volunteers enough to be able to address this issue internally, if you like. And I think we have to recognize that that's not the case in this, uh, in this instance, that when we try to address this, that um, we have to think about what external help we're actually going to need um, to avoid uh, the unconscious bias we have as an organization, if you like. Um, and I'm happy to say that um, so far, the, in, in terms of what we're doing within SCAR and the approach that's going to be taken, nobody's making any assumptions about what we need to do. It's very much a case of we're open at the moment to um, discovering what it is that we need to be thinking about, who needs to be involved. All of those considerations about inclusion and co-design and at the start of the process, so we actually do something that's effective. Um, and I think it's, it's clearly coming from the top down and the bottom up. Our executive committee have told the, the CBET committee that they want to, to hear about practical things to do um, so that we can address the issues that everybody recognizes, not just looking at the statements from the International Science Council, etc., and following up on things like gathering data. That's great. Um, but we do want to move to something that's going to be effective. It's not just going to change statements and wordings and policies here or there. Um, and it's great to see that this session is, uh, is getting the attention that it is. I've just seen through the, um, the question and answer board that somebody is saying, what about, it's great that there's 200 on, but what about the 2000 who are registered and reaching those? I would just point out, we're at about the same sort of level of uh, participation as the uh, plenary lectures at the moment. So this is having significant impact. Um, and so it's now it's just up to us and, and one of the primary places will be through the CBET committee to continue the momentum and to take on board all of uh, what's coming out of last week's session, this session, and move forward with that. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's what we're going to be trying to do. Thank you, Owen. Um, Alex. Thank you. Um, in addition to echoing what was just said, I, I think we also, um, I think the bigger problem we're having in a lot of spheres and talking to a lot of organizations about what we can do about diversity is recognizing the cultural differences and when a diversity issue is being seen as political or not, and especially in these international audiences and recognizing that we're coming to the table with different values, whether it's personal, from your family, to your culture, to national. Um, but to start to really have those big hard conversations. I think we need to recognize that we are a very diverse group coming to this table who are going to have different viewpoints about this. But to echo what Donna and others have said about the fact that by limiting our pool and avoiding these hard conversations, we're not getting the best scientists. And it's, it's an inefficient system. And we need to recognize when we're starting to do harm, not just to individuals, but to the science as well, and ask ourselves, what are these bigger, um, what is our ultimate goal here? If it's really about the science, it should be about the science. And if somebody is diverse and they're doing the best science, it shouldn't matter, yet we're seeing these barriers. Um, I also see an issue myself when we fail to recognize intersectionality, like you have been mentioning, Kara. Um, we see a lot of it's it's not that it's ill and and it's not that there's an ill intention to it, um, but we're seeing a lot of tokenism. And so, um, if somebody will say we would like to support this marginalized group while failing to recognize that they might also have um, other confounding variables that would put them into another underrepresented group, and sometimes the two don't conf it doesn't mesh, and it would mean that you would have to give more resources to one person to really have true equity when we're all fighting for different resources it's sometimes easier to just forget the intersectionality do what we can throw something at a smaller issue while failing to recognize that that doesn't help the bigger picture um, and so i think that all boils down to we need to start having really difficult conversations um, 
amongst our colleagues on big platforms like this on the individual level and start to analyze what it means because we can't wait for the top, um, like somebody was just saying, we can't wait for the top down approach. We really need to be approaching this from both ends. Absolutely, Otto, please do add your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, this is a Northern perspective and I believe the sibling of SCAR, which is I ask, has, has already moved forward in, in many positive ways. And yet to, to come up with, with a <clears throat> sort of skeptical remark and perhaps also linking to what Alex said about um, different values or different perceptions, I believe that within the Northern Circumpolar community of researchers, um, it's, it's not all well taken in, in some quarters to actually point so strongly at the topic of diversity, intersectionality, all this queer stuff, you may say. So if, <clears throat> if you try and find allies, um, such in the initiative in which I'm working, uh, sometimes I wonder if, if I really want to put somebody so strongly into the limelight within a domestic audience of researchers. So that's, that's pretty, pretty much in a way their individual decision uh, in, in which ways and to what extent actually to participate. And I wonder, uh, I wonder how to actually facilitate change on that one. Um, it's, I, I don't find it easy to speak in front of, of, um, of a plenary of 300 people at an international Arctic uh, research and science event if I know that, that I'm actually not, um, that, that my own views or what I'm telling to the audience is not really um, uh, uh, accepted or, or valorized by the government of that country, to put it that way. Thank you. So um, we've got the questions flooding in. So thank you everybody for your engagement. Uh, the most popular question is asking, what are you all actively doing to provide a place for black women on these decision-making boards, including speakers for conferences such as this? Um, uh, I'm gonna take chair's privilege here and say that one of the things that we have said that we want to do is um, the breakout discussions that we'll be having after this panel and after a short break. Uh, we really wanted to follow both of those discussions up with uh, individual Zoom sessions. So we really want to be having those conversations. And as part of that, we would love to have more diversity. I know that like uh, Renuka and I are both women of color, but we can't speak for our black female colleagues at all. And we are going to be actively asking uh, more women from those backgrounds, not just um, from gl the global North either to be joining us for those conversations. And effectively, I think what we need to do is not just to make sure that our black female colleagues are in these spaces, but also that we are there to listen to them and to to hear someone uh, some important truths, I think. Uh, and then I'd like to, if anyone would like to add to that, please do. Um, this is Alex. I would like oh, to Alex. say, um, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I actually, I, I, my work primarily has been in marine biology, looking at penguins in particular, and I have unfortunately not met a lot of um, black female researchers in my field. And it's something I talk about a lot. I brought this uh, prop because I was planning to talk about it later, saying Barbie in the US is typically considered to be not exactly the best representation of women. And yet we have black female Barbie who studies penguins in Antarctica and it makes I got this and it made me kind of sad that we don't have space for women like this in my field um, whenever I've met a black female researcher they've been early career and I also um, co-founded uh, early career penguin scientists it's a group international early career penguin scientists and we've tried on an individual level to arrange for mentorship and i think that's really important is to in your field if you i mean look around the room i i'm going to be looking at the participant list later look who's not here and try to help uplift and even on an individual level i think it can really make a difference but um i would really love to see more diversity in these uh, presentations um, morgan i think you had something you wanted to add there yeah, I think that's an incredibly important um, question, particularly um, as we're all called to 
think much more critically and act much more strongly on the inclusion of um, Black people and especially Black women. Um, we've talked about intersecting um, systems of oppression here. And so um, since Ikra has talked about this session and Alex has, has talked about his field, I'll talk about my historical research very briefly um, to say that it has been a challenge to find um, Black women to include in my research. Part of my research is um, archival, and I'm also doing an oral history project uh, where I'm documenting the life stories of the first generations of women who worked in the Antarctic. There are not a lot of Black women who were among those generations. Um, and so that comes back to some of what Donna was saying about needing to dismantle the barriers that exist and have existed for so long to participation so that we can then uplift voices of people who are included. But of course, that's not enough because change needs to happen now. And because we know that Black women are involved in many ways and um, maybe less visible or experiencing um, challenges uh, being overlooked for things like this. And so in my research um, requires doing a lot of a lot of research specifically trying to find where are the Black women in this history um, and, and thinking creatively about how I'm defining this history. And so I'm gonna use the example of hidden figures that there were not Black women astronauts in the first decades of uh, NASA, but there were Black women contributing in enormously important ways to NASA. And we can do that in our own communities as well. And so um, what I started doing was looking in, for example, administrative roles, um, technician roles, um, and uh, looking at the U.S. Navy, which supported the U.S. Antarctic program for decades, and realizing that as the U.S. Navy withdrew from Antarctica, which meant that more women um, participated um, linked to, to cultural changes around demilitarization um, of these bases, the number of Black women involved in U.S. Antarctic research actually declined significantly because Black women were so much better represented in the U.S. Navy than they were in U.S. Antarctic science, as we think of it. Um, so it's important to, to think creatively about what kinds of roles we're valuing. And I think that Hannah Nielsen and Meredith Nash's research talks a bit about this. And also that it's on me as a researcher to help explain why there aren't more black women involved. And we can transfer that to the um, activist community and to all of us here involved in this conversation to say, it's not just enough to make sure we're involving more black women and people of other marginalized communities if we want to expand outwards, but to help understand why, what we have done, what, what, we're, what problems we're a part of, um, maybe wittingly or not, that keep diversity so low. And I think that's really key for those of us in the majority to help dismantle those barriers. Thank you, Otto, if you'd like to contribute. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I believe that in Arctic, social science research and, and also pretty much all other fields of Arctic uh, research, um, Black women are completely underrepresented and uh, this has to change. Now, um, again, for a Northern perspective, I believe that there's a connection between this debate and the one on inclusion of Indigenous researchers from the First Nations of North America or uh, from Russia, Siberia. And um, I think if, if we use a notion of colonialism or post-colonialism, um, looking at Northern countries, um, there are mechanisms of internal, or let me call that not overseas, yeah, not overseas, um, post-colonial structures, some would say colonial structures, very, very, very uh, visibly at work. So here I, th I believe that um, the, the concept of doing research in a post-colonial way, um, hopefully, that this would also apply to involvement and, and full participation and uh, equal participation of indigenous researchers. That's again a northern point of view, maybe. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to ask another question, and you know, if you have further thoughts on this question, please do add them. So, um, one of the popular questions that's coming up is: sometimes attempts to address racial diversity are sidelined by calls to address geographical diversity. Um, does anyone have suggestions on how to address that issue? Um, who wants to go first? Morgan. 
I don't know that I have a really good suggestion of how to um, address that, but I think uh, one way of thinking about this that, that ought to be taken into account, um, and now it's been a couple of seconds since the question was asked, so I hope that I'm recalling it correctly as a question about uh, racial versus geographic diversity um, mm -hmm. yeah, and institutional efforts towards change, um, is to, to consider how you know, race as a social construct might vary by country and by geography. And so to think about whether we're trying to create a global template for increasing racial diversity um, or whether there are different levels at which that sort of initiative ought to take place um, before they're reconciled at, um, at a broader geographical level. So for example, in the US, um, there's a hugely important national conversation taking place and needs to continue, but also within individual institutions, there might be a more sort of micro level conversation and then using that to expand into more regional and international conversations. Um, and I, I'd like to sort of call forward something that was brought up in last week's session, um, which I think came from Donna, forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, the challenge with language, um, not linguistic diversity, but the words that we use to have these conversations um, that fame, black and minority ethnic is a, a term commonly used in the UK, um, but it doesn't translate very well to some other countries. For example, I'll use the US again, I'm, in the UK and American, forgive me for that, uh, the bias of my examples, um, where in the US, people of color is a much more common term and that itself does not translate everywhere. So we need to be um, adaptable and, and open to having these conversations um, at different registers and having them at different levels as well. Thank you, was there someone else who wanted to weigh in on that? I'll take one more, Alex. Yeah, um, I've seen issues like this come up a lot, um, not just with racial versus geographic, but when you bring up one issue, it's like, oh, but what about this other really relevant issue? And I think it kind of goes back to the idea that you can't necessarily separate some of these things, um, you know, with a racial, uh, racial diversity and geographic diversity, you're gonna have completely different connotations, like Morgan had just said, depending on where you are and what that really means. But I don't think you can, I think that's where we need to step back and start to realize that yes, once we start to have these conversations and recognize that there's another underrepresented group, it's going to seem like there are a ton and it might seem overwhelming. And I think that's the reason we don't tend to have these conversations because once we start to recognize that we haven't done something here, we really do need to do something elsewhere and there are limited resources. Um, but I don't think that means we shouldn't do what we can. And so I think, if we're talking about from perhaps like a small group, whatever perspective, you shouldn't, it shouldn't, issues shouldn't be siloed. And there might be overlapping areas between racial and geographic diversity that can help you meet the same goals. And so you shouldn't necessarily have to choose one or the other, but start to have the conversations about how you can integrate all of this, if that makes sense. I think that's a great answer. Um, so this question, I love, and um, I think I can group this with another question too. So um, we're being asked, while I'm incredibly proud that diversity is being talked about and encouraged within polar science, do you think that there are actually systems in place to support individuals from diverse backgrounds once they enter polar science? And if these systems are in place, are individuals even aware of the support available to them? And I'll add another question to that as well, even though I know that's a beastie question on its own, um, which is uh, asking that, um, Oh, bear with me before I find it. How do you attract um, a diversity of participants into a field where long-term job prospects are uh, and job security is so low? Um, I think those two kind of do go hand in hand. So um, if anyone would like to tackle that question first. Go in. Um, I'll start by saying I have no answers, but um, I would say that um, in terms, I, I think people come to polar research because of a passion for working in the field um, and we want that to be open to everybody so I think we, we look to the ambition and the the ideals of the Antarctic Treaty if you like and how open and equitable that's looking at keeping Antarctica as a place where we do science and keeping the science there open and shared and for the global good um, if you can look at, the, at that as an overall structure and sort of take people's um, and all of the countries who are, uh, um, you know, abiding by that and, and use that as a principle, 
and you know it's a place to start from um but i think it's it, it it's clear that yeah that there's such, such a diversity in terms of approaches about you know the strength and, and size of national programs um organizations like scar can can provide networking and facilitation but we're not a union we're not um, providing legal support we're not in in a place where you know there are a lot of services that people will rely on and, and need that we're not in, in a position to to provide um so where that comes from and, and and you know whether that's sharing information about it whether it's it's support through networks um i think that's a it's a really difficult one to address but again it's one of the ones where we need more information on it um to be able to do things that are practical and useful would anyone else like to win alex so two questions is there support now for people in the fields i think the short answer is maybe it depends on who you are. I think there are some wonderful initiatives that are out there. Um, and there are some fantastic groups that specifically address certain issues for underrepresented people who are making progress. And I think having open conversations like this um, is a really positive step. I first started attending SCAR conferences in 2014. So I have seen progress just in that time on an international whole polar fields wide level. No, I don't think we can say that we really support diversity in the way that we should. Um, I will talk about this a little bit more in the discussion later, but I am an intersex, trans, non-binary, queer, physically disabled, and person who also has learning disabilities. And I have found massive intersectionality issues in terms of one person will accept, fine, you're disabled in this way, but oh, that's unacceptable. You're this, but oh, could you go back in the closet? I, but so no, I don't think we have support for everybody. And I think if we look around the fact that we're, you know, where are the black female speakers? Where, you know, where are these people? No, we, we clearly have a lot more work to do. Um, why do we, keep doing it when there isn't support, I guess, hope. And I work a lot with early career people and I'm very honest in my conversations with them that if they are from a minority um, or marginalized experience, they are gonna have difficulty. And if it's not something that they can handle that I do not blame them if they choose to walk away and choose another career, but if they wanna continue, um, they're going to have to take on a lot. And I think that's also why we don't maybe see more black female speakers is uh, it's a lot of emotional capacity to have to get up repeatedly and talk about your marginalized experience um, and to have to take time away from the research that you want to be doing to have to justify or uplift yourself when you're probably the only one in the room who has that experience. And when a lot of people are just trying to survive, it's a lot to ask. And so I think we need to be honest with people who are coming into this field, but also ask ourselves and recognize if it is so hard, what can we all individually do to make it a little bit easier um, for someone so that we can have better science. Thank you. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that? Because uh, we've got plenty of questions and I will move on to the next one. Um, so. Hugh has brought up a very good point, which is that positive activity with actual real impact usually costs significant amount of money. So pointing to the Polar Horizons project as a specific example, who should be paying for this? Does anyone want to weigh in on that? I mean, I'm happy to offer an opinion. Otto, I'll let you, I'll let you weigh in. Yeah, perhaps um, the the short and easy answer is that I believe both SCAR and IASC do provide opportunities for um, certain amounts of money. In, in the case that I know, it, it was, what was it, 10,000 to 12,000 US dollars over a period of five to seven years. 
And this, as some may call it seed money, was actually helpful in, in establishing um, initiatives. And I believe, well, without that, it, it may be even more difficult. But um, I, I do see that I ask as well as uh, national funding agencies and SCAR um, seem at least much more aware of uh, the issue of inclusion than years ago, and, and perhaps this this uh, this network of initiatives, which which is sort of growing now, that um, it, it will keep uh, it will also remind uh, national funding agencies that there is something uh, to be done. Yeah, and and I believe that um, events like this one can actually help uh, foster. Uh, not just research, but also um, uh, stronger um, incentives and perhaps also procedures that, that do guarantee that inclusion is not just a hollow word or a tokenism. Uh, Morgan, thank you. Um, I think that the, the easy answer here is whoever has the means should be paying for this. And once again, it has to happen at a lot of levels. Um, we all, my six week old has just woken up. I'm sorry if I have to cut out in a second, um, but many of us are based at universities or institutes that need to have localized micro level programs for making sure that people from marginalized backgrounds are included in activities related to Antarctic research. But national Antarctic programs have a huge role to play here. Um, because they are the gatekeepers to Antarctic fieldwork still. And Antarctic fieldwork is so central to success in this field. And then also those of us who have the means can and should be contributing at the grassroots level. Oh, one easy example is that Minorities and Polar Research um, has recently launched an initi initiative um, to get patrons through, uh, through their new website. So please have a look at that. Um, I think anybody who has the means can help with this and we should be lobbying the big institutions that really have the money to be funneling resources that they have towards um, what is an issue of fairness for individuals and also an issue that's um, in the best interests of all these organizations themselves because more diverse teams produce better research, they find better solutions. There's tons of literature on that and uh, we can share that offline through the chat anything later on. Thank you. Um, I've been reminded that we are well over time, so apologies for that. And um, I think if I just take some closing comments for everyone, but if we didn't reach your question, I'm so sorry, but we will definitely have space to, to hopefully have a discussion on those questions in the breakout discussions that will follow this. So uh, please don't be disheartened. Uh, and yeah, if I'll just get one last comment from you, Morgan. Um, I think that we've, done the right thing and are continuing to do the right thing in, in bringing to the forefront the outstanding challenges that our community faces and becoming more diverse, inclusive, and equitable. Um, I think it's really important in Antarctic research because our focus is a continent that's ostensibly been set aside for peaceful scientific purposes in the service of all humanity. And if we are trying to serve all humanity, but doing it with only small slices of humanity, that's a real failing on our part. And we're not gonna be able to produce the kind of research that the entire world needs or to find the solutions that the world needs, particularly around climate change, which is the defining issue of our generation and is something that many of us work on. Um, so it's really on all of us to make sure that we're pressuring uh, institutions to create structural change and doing what we can to contribute to cultural change as well. Thank you. Um, Owen, I'd like you to just sort of add your closing comments too, please. Um, sure. I'd like to say that, you know, we'll hopefully be able to take on board all of the discussion and um, make this a continuing um, an, an ongoing process, basically. It's not going to be a point in time. It, this is clearly going to take a, a lot of time for, for organizations like SCAR to properly address. Um, and so, you know, we'll uh, work with that and uh, yeah we'll welcome uh, feedback at any point uh, to the secretariat individually to us um, um, especially from those who feel they have experienced exclusion um, problems with any of the schemes we run for instance um, we need to hear that we need to get the information um, and that needs to be part of the process that, that uh, we engage in going forward. 
Thank you. Um, Otto, if you'd like to add your closing comments. Yeah, thank you. I believe that um, this network of initiatives of, of pointing at the importance of um, gender related issues, intersectionality, um, people of color, all, all this seems to be gaining momentum right now. This is, this is my personal impression. I don't have a takeaway message, uh, though for myself, I've got one, I'll, I'll uh, try and work more strongly with people at the uh, German Result Research Council, which also finances um, research in, uh, in the Antarctic, to actually make sure that, that these issues uh, will be heard and will be discussed more strongly. Uh, thank you for that commitment. Um, Alex, if you'd like to add any of your closing comments. Thanks. Um, just echoing what people have said, I think this begins ultimately at the individual level, people asking organizations to make changes, people having conversations with their colleagues to change a culture around talking about diversity issues. Um, and so I think especially moving forward into the discussions, I just ask everyone to invite themselves to be a little bit uncomfortable. These conversations are gonna be a little bit hard for everybody. Um, I think it can be a silent reflection, it can be a group reflection, but just acknowledge how how as an individual, everybody can do something. We can all be a little bit better. We've all contributed in some way to something that might have harmed somebody, but we can't really fix things until we start to acknowledge and name things and recognize that it doesn't make any of us bad people. It doesn't make organizations bad, but we just have to recognize we're facing this cultural shift, I think, internationally. And it's gonna be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's not a bad thing. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, thank you so much. So um, uh, I am well aware that we are about 20 minutes over time at the moment. Um, we were going to have a comfort break of about 10 minutes after this panel discussion was done. I would like to possibly shorten that to five minutes. So if folks want to go stretch their legs for a little bit, um, get a cup of tea perhaps, um, get yourself a drink. And, and when you come back to us in five minutes, we'll be kicking off um, the first sort of breakout discussion. Uh, I'll just give you guys a quick um, rundown of how that will happen. So um, this will be a purely text-based uh, session uh, when we come back in about five minutes. So please do just sort of use the Q&A function. We'll be having several polls um, for folks to, to answer questions. And what we are planning on doing is to have a follow-up to this uh, in a few weeks time. So we'll have a poll on there asking if folks are interested in joining uh, a further discussion on some of the themes that we'll be introducing during the two breakout discussions, the first of which will be chaired by myself, the second by Alex. So um, I do encourage you to, to go away for five minutes, stretch your legs, um, grab yourself a drink, and um, we'll see you in five minutes.
Uh, so thank you if you're joining us um, for the second half of our session. Uh, we're, we were planning on having two breakout sessions, which were initially going to be about uh, half an hour each. I think we'll just have to shorten those to be able to make uh, enough time for our final panel discussion uh, later on. So the way that we'd envisioned this was that um, it would be text-based. So shortly there will be some questions appearing in the poll function on, on air. Um, we would love for you to engage with those. We'll be collecting that data as part of the executive summary that we're putting together at the end of this session, along with um, really sort of uh, focusing down on the themes that have been brought up by our participants in this session. Um, so if you could engage with that when those poll questions are put up, please do. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is with these breakout discussions being primarily text-based, it'd be really, really lovely to follow these up uh, with something that allows for more face-to-face -face interaction. So we're hoping to do that in a few weeks on Zoom. That'll be one of the poll questions that you'll see shortly. And um, yeah, please let us know because we'd like to get an idea for what kind of um, numbers we'd like to see for that. And then we'll put some sessions together on Zoom in the coming weeks. So I had a few prompt questions. Um, I really would love people to offer their comments um, via the Q&A or the discussion forum functions. Um, and the way I've envisioned this is that I will be sort of picking out some of the themes that are coming up. Um, I'd like to point out that for those who are unaware that there is the option to post anonymously in the live Q&A function. So if there is something that you would like to share and you'd prefer not to have your name attached to it, please do use that function. I think it's been really, really useful so far. Um, and I'd encourage you to use that if you would like to. Um, so some of the questions I had for the first breakout discussion was focusing on this idea of how do we embrace intersectionality and how do we go about um, building more inclusive collaborations? What are we doing wrong so far? And so, uh, the questions I would like to put to you, the audience, is that I um, would encourage you to think of if you have any examples of good interdisciplinary collaborations that you've seen uh, in recent years that we can learn from, please do share those experiences uh, using the Q&A function, because um, we will be sort of saving those comments for later uh, when we sort of try and distill the session into a summary that we'll be sending out to institutions. Uh, don't worry, anything will be anonymized at that point anyhow. Um, how do we currently define and measure the success of various types of interdisciplinary collaboration? If you have any thoughts on that, please offer those as well. Um, what are the benchmarks that are being used or under, underutilized when it comes to, uh, to sort of discussing whether or not an interdisciplinary it's interdisciplinary, sorry, collaboration is successful. Are there any better benchmarks out there that you've seen or that you've theorized? Um, and I think one of the things that I think really has been one of the driving forces for this um, session is we know that we're not doing everything and that we can absolutely do better. And if there are things that have come up during the session that you would like to challenge and that you would like to call us out on and suggest better ways for this to be done in the future, please do. We really welcome that feedback as we go. Um, and if there are ways that you can detail in which our fields are exclusionary to specific marginalized communities, perhaps a, mar perhaps a marginalized community that you yourself are, as, as a, are a part of and you would like to share that experience I really would urge you to do that. So I know that this is quite a lot uh, to just be throwing um, into uh, this session, but really what I was envisioning for this was to, to have folks share their experiences uh, in the Q&A uh, and for us to really just sort of pull out uh, the themes uh, in terms of what we can work on going forwards, what further conversations need to be had and um, and how the conveners of this session can really um, focus our efforts going forward as well, because I think we're all um, committed to to making the changes in the spaces that we 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 have any kind of uh, ability to do so. So um, please do uh, add your comments and your questions. Um, I will just sort of be reading them out on Zoom, so we have. A record of them and similarly if you'd like to take some time away from this session please do that as well uh, we'll be having a second breakout session in about 15 minutes which will be chaired 
by my colleague Alex, um, which will focus on uh, the theme of diversity and inclusion, specifically in fieldwork and in professional uh, events, so conferences, things like that. Um, and so that will start in about 15 minutes. So if you want to come back for that, please do. Um, and we'll have our panel discussion um, with uh, several Antarctic leaders, uh, which will begin at 20 past five UTC. So if you'd rather dip out for this part of the workshop, feel free to, and we'll see you later on. So some of the, the questions that we had um, from the last session, which unfortunately we couldn't answer in the panel, um, uh, asking, you know, are there other are research areas that we can learn from? Uh, uh, I think one of the, uh, the themes that seemed quite uh, prominent to me, and it was a question for, um, for Morgan, was uh, asking specifically for our research. So those questions have been saved and, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get those answered by the panelists if they're still um, available to do that. Um, but yeah, like if you want to be um, sharing your uh, experiences, please do. So again, so the questions we're asking in this first breakout discussion are, do you have any examples of good interdisciplinary collaboration that you feel that we can learn from? Please do share those using the Q&A function. Um, and uh, how do we sort of define or measure the success of those collaborations? Uh, what benchmarks have you seen for uh, deciding whether those collaborations are successful um, and do you think that there are better benchmarks out there? Similarly, you know, when it comes to issues of diversity and inclusion, what are the ways in which you've seen our field be exclusionary? Please do share those experiences. Um, so we're starting to get uh, contributions in, so thank you very much. Um, someone's uh, said, in our conversations in the Diversity in Polar Research Initiative, we've realized the importance of providing training for allies about what it feels like to be in the shoes of someone who's in a minority. We're in the advanced stages of devising that training, but would also very much value to hear from others as to which kind of training comes with recommendations. Does anyone have any? And so I'd really urge you to contribute to that. Um, and, uh, and if you have any examples or any recommendations, please do offer them in the Q&A. Uh, an anonymous uh, contribution is a, a benchmark that's been seen is aiming towards a diverse community that mimics the population that it pulls from. I think we saw an example of that earlier on with uh, Donna, who was pulling up the numbers in terms of UK polar science and seeing how the numbers of disabled uh, researchers and scientists in polar research, as well as the numbers of those from uh, ethnic minorities uh, sort of uh, compared to the numbers of the general population. I think that's a fantastic benchmark. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, if there's any other benchmarks that folks would like to share, either ones that have been used which aren't uh, particularly useful or those which are useful, that would be fantastic. Please do keep um, adding to the discussion using the Q&A. Um, we've got some more additions. Uh, someone said, I don't have recommendations for training, I'm afraid, but also interested to hear what works. I would like to know if there's any specific training for people on recruitment and selection panels to counter unconscious biases, which take intersectionality into account. So if anyone has recommendations for that kind of resource, please do share that. Uh, we've got our first uh, poll as well now. So if you would like to attend a follow-up discussion to this on Zoom in the coming weeks, uh, please do vote on whether or not you would like to do that. Um, and hopefully we can uh, see how much interest we've got. Um, there's already 10 votes for yes and uh, a few for maybe, so thank you very much. Um, Hughes shared his experience saying, as a white, gay, British cis man, I could never say that I have experienced over homophobia at work. However, through listening to the stories of those less fortunate than myself, it's made me realize that more needs to be done and also made me readdress my experiences. Thank you for sharing that here. I really, really appreciate that. Um, we've got uh, another comment coming in uh, saying, 
Uh, as allies, we need to be willing to see the absence of diversity without expecting people from underrepresented communities to point it out to us. Um, I think we saw a, a great example of, of us as a convening team failing to do that earlier, actually, um, when we were asked uh, what we were doing specifically to uplift the black women around us. And I think um, also being able to take that criticism on the chin uh, and say, we haven't done that this time, we'll do it in the future and we'll do better next time. Um, the second point was training is great, but in practice, I think sometimes it doesn't really reach the people who need it. Institutions need to make it, it genuinely mandatory and then to track engagement. And I do agree with that too. Um, so thank you for that comment, Alice. I think that's really, really useful. We should have another couple of questions coming out in our poll very shortly. Um, so please do engage with those. And as I've said, if you have any resources that you would like to share, you can share those in the discussion forum on on air or through the Q and A function, which I think is a little bit more visible and allows people. Important. Uh, there's been some uh, another question, which I think is a really important one, which is, what about those that uh, deny this issue? Um, I think that is another theme that we haven't quite touched on just yet, um, which I think will be something that we need to to touch on going forward. Is how do we, like Hugh said earlier, how do we make sure we're not preaching to the converted, and how do we get across to those who who don't believe this is an issue at all? The contributions are now flowing in. Thank you, everybody. Um, someone said, uh, Shannon said, I agree that it's important to provide training or at least emphasize the importance of being aware of the experiences for minorities for allies within the community. In my previous experience with Paula field work, uh, I was an undergraduate at the time and a mixed race woman. I feel that I felt that the people around me were aware of how my race and gender might affect my experience, but didn't know how to discuss this with me or put measures in place to try and make things easier for me. Having training or awareness seminars that would give them this knowledge without putting the onus of explaining on the minorities themselves would be much appreciated. Um, we've got another comment that says national programs and employers need to show publicly that they're serious about inclusion. Uh, I can't agree with more with that. Um, we've got another contribution from Chandrika saying, as a woman with caring responsibilities, I'd find it really helpful for some way to help my family recognize the pressures of my job and my needs to do it well. Um, supporting diversity works both ways. And I think that's a really, really fantastic contribution because I can understand that too, to some degree, because um, it is about going both ways. Um, uh, further sort of contributions, I'm just picking these out as I go now. Uh, training leadership within organizations on how to create a culture of inclusivity is an important aspect of progress. Um, uh, someone suggested uh, that at EGU 2020, they encountered a uh, something called Did This Really Happen? And there's a link there. Folks would like to go to the Q&A to have a look at it. Um, uh, and that seems to be a uh, examples of gender discrimination illustrated through cart cartoons, which could be a way to engage with folks who don't realize or are denying problems. Um, what's this Q&A? Uh, we've got uh, another question in the poll there, if people would like to engage with that, asking, have your own intersectional identities created a barrier to entry for you? Um, and I would really be interested in seeing how many of the participants um, uh, here, of the number that we've got, um, have experienced barriers to entry. Thank you for engaging with that. Um, Uh, so Emmanuel Sultana is saying that she practices Southern Ocean Antarctic 
in the Antarctic field since 1996. It's, there's been an evolution for sure towards the number of the women in the field, but not in terms of visibility. I think again, going back to the earlier question of um, including black women, and um, it's it's that thing of like, it's not that there aren't people doing the work, it's how do we uh, improve visibility for those who are doing the work? Um, I did see another comment that I really wanted to highlight. Um, a comment for training on a personal level. Naming your identity, so this is coming from someone who's a black middle income cisgender woman. Uh, from that point, I see where you hold privilege and where, do you, where you do not. This will allow for immediate introspection and potentially open up avenues to go forward on a personal level. Uh, and I completely agree with that contribution. I think um, any sort of uh, conversation has to begin with with folks having that introspection where they um, sit and understand where their own privileges come from and and also like where their identities can can lead them to come up against barriers. And I think uh, for a lot of folks who want to be good allies, either in terms of uh, racial um, diversity, diversity in terms of social class, other issues around queer representation in terms of, of including people from the global south, linguistic diversity, all these things that we've touched on. Um, the place to start is to really understand where we hold power and privilege. Um, uh, thank you everybody for your contributions. I'm very aware of the fact that I need to wrap this up so that my colleague Alex can, um, uh, can uh, lead the second breakout discussion. Um, so hopefully he'll be able to pick up on some of the comments I have not been able to pick up on. Um, I think we should be able to share the um, results of the polls um, once we've got a, a fair number of, um, of, of folks voting in them. Uh, so definitely towards the end of the second breakout discussion, we'll be sharing those results in the poll function. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I will hand over to Alex now, if you're ready to go, Alex, with the themes that you are going to touch on. Thank you everyone for your engagement. This has been amazing. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what we can do going forward. Alex, I'll hand over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Igra. So we're gonna be doing a very similar format to what just happened, but talking a little bit about uh, exclusion and diversity issues in either a professional event setting or in a remote field setting. Um, I wanna kick this off and give people a couple seconds to start writing in their thoughts. But to introduce myself, I know I've personally faced barriers um, in terms of both field events, uh, sorry, working in the field and professional events. Um, Pride and Polar Research started at Polar 2018 because I had a massive panic attack because I had been told Hello? that as an intersex person, a disabled hey, person, that I wasn't going to be able to uh, participate in field work. I've been told that because I'm visibly queer, they can't have me talking to the public. I can't be the visible face of my own science. As a disabled person, I had barriers to entry where I can't take some of the standardized exams. I had just seen uh, all of these different things happening and realized that I didn't feel I couldn't get into the field at a professional event. I felt like I was alone, the only intersex, openly queer person in many spaces, the only disabled person talking, and it can be really hard. And so we wanted to talk about how can we support marginalized people when they might be the only people in the room and how can we advocate for them um, when we have limited resources. So we'd love to hear from you to explore these ideas that equity might take more resources in different events. Um, and so we have about 15, 20 minutes to explore these ideas and we're gonna be having, there might be some delay in me reading the questions, I apologize because I'm also on a phone, which is probably something else we should explore in terms of how these professional events are held. It's fantastic that we can now access more people, but we're still also gonna be facing technology issues um, and having people who don't have access to the same resources. Let me see the questions. So some of the questions that I know we've talked about before um, or that have come up are 
when we have professional events that are held in areas where it might actually be illegal to exist as uh, just as yourself. Um, recent, it, we've had conferences held in countries where it might be illegal to be someone who is queer, who has an LGBTIQ identity. And as a event organizer, can we take a look at what access issues might be on that very core level? Can somebody actually travel to your country? And if they're gonna have issues um, getting there, how do we make it accessible? Can we do something like these remote online events? Um, we have a question, how do we resolve the conflict that can arise between inclusion of emerging Antarctic nations and the barriers to LGBTQI plus or women in those countries? Holding conferences in those countries can have a huge impact but can actively exclude minorities. Exactly, you know, what, what do we do because we want to include everybody. This goes back to that international conversation and recognizing that we have these different values and diversity can be an incredibly political issue uh, depending on what those values might be and it's something that we need to address um, in looking at these workout uh, these breakout groups and discussions we discuss what we might like to see beyond just having a place where we can talk about this and we discussed maybe having some kind of code of conduct um, groups like apex on the early career level have done a really fantastic job developing a field of uh, a field work code of conduct that starts to address some of these issues that's something that can be more widely accepted and worked on by the international community to begin to address what that might look like um, somebody's saying social media is a fantastic way to engage with minorities to find out the issues directly relating from them hashtag black and STEM and hashtag disabled and STEM are fantastic examples of this. There's been an interesting discussion on Twitter in recent weeks about the need for a geologist to do field work to qualify. We need to engage minorities at all levels to develop training. That's absolutely correct. I know um, when I was going through grad school, I had to fill out all kinds of special waivers because they didn't want somebody with my disability in particular being in the field, um, even though it was a requirement for graduation and regardless of whether I could actually do it or not, it, there are a lot of issues about this. And uh, somebody was mentioning earlier, especially in this time of COVID, we're starting to realize what can be done um, without being in the field. And I think most of us are well aware that we have lots of data that's sitting in reserves, not being touched. And we might start to expand our idea of what it takes to contribute to this field. Um, a comment for training on a personal level, naming your identity. For example, I am a black middle income cisgender woman. And from that point, see where you hold privilege and where you do not, privilege being access, rank, power. This will allow for immediate introspection and potentially open up avenues to go forward on a personal level. And I absolutely agree. And I actually apologize because I meant to do that. Um, I mentioned earlier, my name is Alex Thornton. I am, uh, one of the co-founders of Pride and Color Research. I have my own uh, research and communication business here in Fairbanks, Alaska. I live on unceded uh, lands of the lower Tanana Dene uh, indigenous people here. I am a white, relatively able-bodied, but still um, disabled person. I am not a primary caretaker for anyone. I come from a middle-class family of people who support academics and who were teachers. Um, I live in the United States but I face um, barriers being an intersex, trans, non-binary, queer, disabled person with various disabilities. Um, and I think it also, it does help to recognize those, uh, those powers that we have um, and what allows us to come to the table today. Um, it's really important uh, for all of those within, uh, for, for all of those within that, that those who speak openly about prejudice and discrimination are not just complaining. We need to move forward away from the just deal with it approach. Absolutely. Um, I think this also invites people to open up ourselves to having difficult conversations with ourselves. If somebody says something and our first instinct is to, why do they have to talk about this? Um, you know, why is this important? To reflect on ourselves, why are we thinking these things? What is it about our values that allows us to do that? And how can we instead make it so that we have an environment where everybody comes to the table equally? Um, so 
regarding a poll question asking whether identities have been our barriers, it can be hard to know. For example, when you don't get a job, it's not like the feedback says, we don't want a bisexual woman. Indeed, if unconscious bias, bias was a factor, the interview panel probably wouldn't even realize this was a factor. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I know I've been told to my face and I've also been told subtly um, by people that it was an issue without being told. And it makes it really hard. And I think, um, Ikra brought up Kimberly Crenshaw. If you're not familiar with her work, um, please do take a look. Um, there are some fantastic primers on her research and it talks a little bit about this and these, how these biases can continue um, in a way that it can be, make it really hard to address. Uh, with online events, is there a potential problem that if we don't actively consider inclusion from the start, we may actually end up just creating new exclusions instead of addressing old ones? For example, may, it may be more accessible regarding income groups, but less accessible considering not everyone has the same access to internet and technology. Absolutely, um, we're gonna find out that there are barriers at various levels, and it seems impossible that we're gonna be able to do everything perfectly for everyone. But the idea is to make it as accessible as possible. And I think even from like the SCAR conference, it's fantastic and we're learning new things. Um, and we'll just have to improve for next time. And sometimes it takes doing something different and trying to consider, but also remembering inviting people from those different groups. Somebody earlier brought up um, the fact that maybe interpreters should be involved. Um, it's fantastic to consider those things from the start, whether it's bathrooms or interpreters or different technology. Um, I believe it's important to provide training or at least emphasize the importance of being aware of the experiences for minorities for for allies within the community. In my previous experience with polar field work, I was an undergraduate at the time and I'm a mixed race woman. I felt that the people around me were aware of how my race, the gender might affect my experience, but didn't know how to discuss this with me or put measures in place to try and make things easier for me. Having training or awareness seminars that would give them this knowledge without putting the onus of explaining it on the minorities themselves would be much appreciated. Absolutely, um, and I think that's where we can try to hopefully find support for different groups that are popping up. We have women in polar science, pride in polar research, minorities in uh, polar science. Um, and I think if we can try to work together and provide support for the people who are willing to give that emotional labor, um, and especially for organizations, if you're writing a grant, build in some funds to help pay this trainer and to allow them to spread this word um, because it shouldn't have to come down to the people on your team to explain or justify their own experiences. Um, but it's also smart. Um, so hopefully leadership later will be talking about how from a more management perspective, you can make it possible to have a safe space for people to ask the questions they need without uh, putting the burden on the team member. We need to discuss what to do in case of people refusing to engage with training and understanding diversity, both when an individual is affected by this and the field as a whole. Absolutely. And I think we hope to hear from people now, and this is going to be an ongoing conversation where we'd love to see something like a code of conduct um, come into place, where perhaps it's required training, like you need required safety training, that you have to go through some kind of required diversity training that allows you to be able to empathize with your team members, because we all know that if you don't have those interpersonal relationships in the field, things can go south really quickly, pun not intended. Um, in recent years, the mental health of graduate students and early career researchers is being challenged. I'm a white cis woman with a history of what I would consider mild to moderate depression, and I am lucky that I am okay with going to a psychiatrist or counselor to talk about my mental health. How can we make it okay for people to talk about their mental challenges? How do we make sure that marginalized communities, which more often than not have higher mental health issues and are able to get the mental health need without any level of stigma, that is a very complicated issue, and I think it's something we should really be talking about and could probably, and probably should um, take its own workshop at some point to talk about how we can address the mental health issues. Um, I encourage uh, you to reach out to us um, and hopefully we can organize some kind of conversation to talk about that because there's levels of access, the cultural barriers, um, and just making it open in, fields where um, I know I've had many conversations with people who are afraid to say that 
if they take any medications for depression, uh, they might be automatically excluded from the field. And when field work is so essential to so many of our jobs, how can we make it safe for people to be able to get the help they need and be honest about it, but still be able to do their jobs, which they're capable of? I think a lot of, uh, that question, I think a lot of training or awareness seminars need to become more proactive rather than reactive. A lot of time, we only see diversity being discussed once diverse people have already entered, or there has been an incident of racism, sexual harassment, et cetera, et cetera rather than putting measures in place to ensure these types of incidents can be pre prevented before they occur. Absolutely. I think this is where we're hoping to if it's not a code of conduct for professional events or for seminars, thing maybe even just a checklist of things that people should start to consider. And it's never gonna be perfect, but that's why it's gonna be a living document. Um, but yeah, I, I agree, this, this happens a lot and it definitely needs to change, but it takes people on the individual level asking leadership to include these measures. It takes management making the initiative and actually putting it in there. Um, I think that's where conversation like this help, but we also ask that everybody recognize this is an individual thing as well. Um, somebody else asks, national programs and employers need to show publicly that they are serious about inclusion. Absolutely. Um, and somebody says, I think these polls are good, but it might be effective to send out a survey to the whole of our community to take into account the people that were not able to attend the session and want to share their experiences. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I know um, there are people from SCAR on this call and I will certainly also bring that back to the CBEC community as a point to, um, but I'm sure something like that has already been thought of, but just in case. Um, I am on phase one design workshop to facilitate inclusion process in a group uh, with, would like to share this with the group. I have never tested it online and why not test that device sometimes? Absolutely. Um, I think we would love to see a group come out of this uh, who wants to continue uh, talking about these things. And so um, you can reach out to any of the co-conveners here. You can reach out to me individually. If you're on Twitter, um, I'm at Antarctic Waters. Um, you can also reach out to Pride and Polar Research at Pride Polar on Twitter, or you can send me an email directly at alex at polarecology.com. Um, we have another five minutes or so for questions in this conversation. Um, but we would like to also hear, have you had any really effective arguments um, to help bring about equity in your own organization or where you work? Um, and what, if we're talking about a code of conduct, what would it need to look like for you to make this something that you could accept? Um, what would the barriers be? Do you, would you need to run it up the flagpole at your organization and get higher approval? Um, somebody else is saying, any advice on how to deal with events that impact you differently because of your identity, but maybe not your colleagues. For example, anti-Black police brutality, anti-LGBTQIA plus laws being passed in your town, sexual harassment cases at your university institution. What if something like this is impacting your productivity? What if you're not personally affected, but are concerned that these events may have a greater impact on your colleagues because of their differing identities? Any advice for dealing with these types of current events versus direct discrimination at you individually? Absolutely. I know um, as I had to leave my last graduate program because um, they weren't able to provide support for a queer disabled student. And um, part of that too was in my town, we had an LGBTQIA equality um, or just a general equality law passed and then vetoed immediately. And so every night I was at city hall meetings talking about things, trying to organize while also trying to do my research. And I think um, we also need to recognize that everybody who comes to the table is an individual and they all have things they care about at home, whether it's their children and their family or some greater, social issue that's impacting them. And it does impact your productivity, but people need to be allowed to have um, that human essence and what makes them them. Otherwise we really lose the diversity at all. And so we can't expect everybody to come in and just be cogs in a machine without recognizing that they're going to have things that impact them differently. I know a lot of my um, black colleagues now, um, 
or Black, Indigenous, people of color uh, right now in the United States are having a really difficult time doing their work, looking at um, what's happening with police brutality and people being killed. And some of them have fantastic uh, supervisors who recognize that they need to take a step back and focus on their mental health. While others are being asked to work and frankly, they're considering leaving the field because they feel like their identity is conflicting with their research. Um, I know for myself, I had to step back away from the marine biology, which is my training and what I love to focus on sociology issues because you realize you're not able to do both. And so I think we need to be able to make space for people to be themselves, but also do their jobs. Um, somebody is saying, I sometimes find it difficult to decide what it is best for a certain group without having representative within the decision-making panel or planning panel. Having efforts been made to seek out different minorities within a formal panel to better advise on ways that would work to make them feel inclusive. It can be really hard. Um, I, as part of the reason I had to step back from marine biology and focus more on sociology and diversity issues is I realized that you can't do everything. And we need to recognize um, in all of these issues as allies too, we're gonna have to do some of the research ourselves. And there's a lot of fantastic um, resources out there where we can start and having conversations like this as colleagues where we can help feed this information to each other um, without asking the emotional labor of the people who are marginalized and who are also facing these issues in their social life. We don't wanna to have to come to work and also talk about them. Um, so I think that's where the individual level, we can all do a little bit better. Um, and then one last question that's coming in is when will we have a diversity and inclusion focused plenary speaker at a SCAR meeting or a diversity and inclusion SCAR medal? Um, hopefully soon. I know, um, I'm hoping that SCAR will announce uh, in the later meetings this week for CBET some of their plans on these things. But I know um, for meetings, I'm optimistic about what's coming. And I hope that um, within SCAR, we can see some positive changes that will allow other organizations to look at them as a model to reflect and improve the field as a whole. Um, with that, please do message us uh, with any questions or comments you would have about what the code of conduct might look like, what you would need to see and other issues or experiences you've had so that we can continue to talk about these issues. Um, we appreciate that you've taken the time to participate in this workshop. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Ikra. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for all of your contributions. This has been so, I mean, I feel like we, we definitely could have gone on longer if we'd had the time. And um, so many folks have said that they'd be interested in attending a follow-up discussion to um, in the coming weeks on Zoom. So uh, once we've wrapped up this workshop, we would love to um, to send that out. So please do keep an eye out. We'll try and see if we can, we can get SCAR to send the information for that out once we've organized it. Um, and so if you're interested in, in carrying on this conversation, we really, really hope you are, um, then please keep an eye out for that and, and do join us. Um, I think uh, we should probably take another break now, um, let everyone stretch their legs, possibly get a drink. Thanks again for your contributions. Uh, we weren't really sure what to expect with this being sort of text-based and uh, everyone's gone above and beyond in terms of engaging with the discussion and with the polls. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Um, so. I think we'll go for a break of possibly longer than five minutes now. We've got, uh, no, but we'll, we'll go for five minutes and that gives us plenty of time for our final panel. So um, we'll see you in five minutes uh, for our final panel uh, where we talk to several Antarctic leaders um, about the issues and some of the themes that have been raised during these breakout discussions. Um, so we hope you'll join us then. Thank you very much.
Marcelo, we can see you there. Welcome. Hello, Donna. Hi, Kelly. How are you? How are you, Chandran? Yeah. Hi, Marcelo. We, did, we haven't met yet, Donna, but I did hear you this morning, so you did a lovely <laughs> job. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you. We're just, uh, the feed is still live during the break, but I just wanted to check that everyone was happy that their video was working. Uh, so welcome back everybody. Um, chairing this next session will be the, our co-chair Donna. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, it's been a long session and we've been really looking forward to this panel. So without further ado, Donna, take it away. Thank you very much, Ikra. And uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for our final panel of the afternoon. Uh, it is termed a leadership panel. And I certainly believe we've got some sensational leaders of Antarctic research here with us today. I think we have most of COMNAP, which is the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs with us. And um, I'm just gonna run quickly through our four panelists and then I'll, I'll ask you to add any further introductions. Uh, I'd like to welcome Jane Rumble. Jane's the head of the Polar Regions Department for the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office and only the fourth person to hold that position. So welcome, Jane. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kelly, Dr. Kelly Faulkner, who's the director of the National Science Foundation's Office of Polar Programs in the United States. Welcome, Kelly. I'd like to welcome Dr. Ravi Chandra, who's the National Center of Polar and Ocean Research in India Director. Welcome, Ravi. And also welcome to Dr. Marcelo Lepe, who's the Director of the Chilean Antarctic Institute and also the Chilean representative at SCAR. So welcome 
so much to our uh, panelists. I wonder if I could ask you to uh, tell our audience today uh, why diversity is important to you. I think I'll start by asking you and then um, if you have something to add through the conversation, please just raise your hands. So Jane, would you like to start? Can you tell us why diversity is important to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you. I'm sorry I've missed most of the um, earlier events. Uh, I've just finished my day job, so uh, it's great to be able to join you now. Um, so for us, uh, diversity, I think, is pretty crucial to um, everything that we do. Uh, so I work in the public service in the United Kingdom, uh, and I'm a probably a policy specialist more than anything else. Uh, and we've always been clear that to make good policy, uh, you need to have considered it from all angles. And if you wanna make policy that imp impacts on people, then you need to really understand everybody's perspective. Uh, so trying to get the public sector in the UK to mirror the UK uh, makeup uh, is an ongoing challenge, uh, but one that brings a kind of breadth and, and uh, depth of uh, input that we definitely need to benefit from. I think moving in that into kind of the polar world, uh, not only do we need kind of a diversity of scientists, uh, both personal diversity, but as well as multidisciplinary to properly understand Antarctica and then understand what those, uh, what that means for everybody else. Um, we also need to have people that can translate that into policy and interpret what that means for kind of wider society. But then crucially, we also need to get people to understand uh, Antarctica, and particularly what's happening to it. And that understanding needs to come from a range of people and people in the outside world often hear it better if it comes from somebody who's starting from a similar starting point as them so having a diverse range of voices is also incredibly important to kind of um, make it clear what the outreach is so I believe Donna you've already done your presentation about the diversity in polar science initiative that we launched in the UK to try and uh, sort ourselves out uh, in that our diversity is is not as uh, good as it should be. Um, I sort of joined the polar world in um, 2003 uh, and there were very, very few women involved at that point. I'm glad to say that's uh, completely changed, but um, yeah, still a long way to go. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. Kelly, would you like to tell us why diversity and inclusion is important to you and to the NSF? Absolutely, and I'll be speaking for my NSF hat as opposed to the COMNEP chair hat. Um, so I have heard throughout the sessions you have been involved in earlier today and, and earlier uh, in SCAR, some of what I'm gonna say. So I'm just really uh, reiterating some points you have all nicely made, but so we know from research um, and we're research focused at NSF, that across multiple sectors, be it business or our own enterprise, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM fields that we call them, that diversity strengthens the ability of groups to generate good ideas. And diversity fosters that higher creativity, the innovation, um, faster problem solving, and more robust decision making. So that's really unambiguous. So that's a very important reason to, to value diversity. I want to just suggest that from my point of view, where I sit in the Office of Polar Programs, that diversity has long been a um, consideration for us because we work in the north in a region that is populated by a small but very important indigenous uh, peoples who have lived there for millennia. So we have a special responsibility to engage uh, diversely in the north that we, we are still working on getting better at, but it's, it's been there as a driving force for us for a long time. So I'll, I'll leave it there, turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Kelly. Ravi, would you like to tell us why diversity and inclusion is important to you and director? Yeah. Of course, uh, science needs uh, diversity. Of course, Antarctica is a place for science and multidisciplinary and multinational as well as multicultural collaboration is key to Antarctic research. In order to increase our intellectual capital, we need more collaboration and diversity. Different background as well as different thought process, culture, 
set of specified skills, skills will offer more creativeness. Of course, the lack of diversity limits the innovation and thus we collectively try to overcome the obstacles to increasing diversity. I personally feel that our subconscious mind always prefers to pick someone we connect with and we unintentionally marginalize people from other backgrounds. We need to avoid such herd mentality like so-and-so are good in research or so-and-so not good like that. So more out of the box idea has to come. It has to emerge only, then only we can have a, uh, more diversity. Of course, each one is uh, having more uh, unique talent, which we need to nurture and harness for the benefit of the mankind. So hence the diversity is important, we feel. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ravi. Marcelo, can you tell us uh, why you think inclusion and diversity is important? Well, I, I am biologist by training, so I understand very well the, the importance of maintaining uh, uh, the diversity. Um, in, in terms of um, an ecological perspective to maintain a, a community, in a community the diversity probably, probably provides us uh, a, um, a different road, uh, range of responses and, uh, in facing different problems, including different origins, uh, approaches, ambitions uh, in our Antarctic program uh, is probably the best way to to prepare us uh, to answer the, in a better way the challenges of Antarctic science. Chile is a very conservative country, uh, as you probably know, and uh, we are facing uh, um, a group of um, different problems in the moment, not only COVID-19. The, the second is uh, re, it, we have started to reimagine how to be our near uh, future and uh, diversity and inclusion it will be key in the, 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 the redesign of our country. So probably we will transmit that to our National Antarctic Program. That's excellent. Um, thank you and thank you all for that uh, understanding of why you're happy to speak with us today. Marcelo, I might stay with you. You, you mentioned you know, the, the global current movement in diversity and inclusion. What would you like to see with Chile with the with a change in diversity and inclusion? What would you like to see? I'm really I'm, I'm really happy to say that we, we uh, talking about uh, uh, the discussion, the fundamental discussion about the possibility to have a society uh, uh, including all these visions, um, the transmission to the, the National Antarctic Program is something that uh, we found very relevant in the in a very challenging moments that we are facing today. Um, uh, we are happy to say that today the leading uh, the leaders of the science programs we have uh, around 108 to 120 projects uh, in Antarctica at the moment, and and they are led by 52 percent of men and, and 48, 49 uh, women. Uh, and this is uh, probably the best numbers that we have ever exhibited in, in, in the program. I am convinced that if you provide all the possibilities to, uh, to participate in all the instruments that you have in a broad way, um, and you will face probably a, a, a different, a, a very diverse composition of, uh, of the National Antarctic programs. In the same way, 10 years ago, we decided to, uh, to offer the same conditions to the National Antarctic Fair, one initiative to, uh, for the scholars to, to approach the Antarctic research and the importance of Antarctica. And we start to pay to people from all the regions in this, exactly in the same way. Before that, uh, to apply to, to, the, to the National Antarctic Fair, you have to pay it by your own uh, money. But uh, including this new budget, uh, we also uh, amplify the, the, the effect. And today we have a very strong young community involved in Antarctic science. And this is uh, something, just a sample, and we are uh, pushing in the, exactly in the same way the rest of the program. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Kelly, would you like to tell us uh, also the obvious changes there have been inside the polar community uh, and with the NSF, but is there anything else that you would like to see to change in the future? Well, uh, at least from the US perspective, I think what we're looking for is a goal of having participation reflective of our national population. Um, and it is not right now. Our demographics are very different from uh, the polar uh, research complexion. Um, so when we, we do know a few things about what we need to improve. Um, I think, you know, we've been uh, working pretty hard and the Me Too movement came along in parallel with trying to understand um, effects of or why there's a leaky pipeline. Let's put it that way for women and, and uh, the challenges there. And I think we need to remind ourselves, we had a wonderful study done by our National Academy uh, of Sciences on that subject. And um, people have been struggling for years thinking, well, maybe it's because they're having children, they're falling out of the pipeline and not being able to get back in and, and on and on. But, but what they found when they did um, more thorough research on it, 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 that wasn't the main driving factor. In fact, it was something which they labeled uh, gender harassment. It's a little more subtle than um, what we think of as uh, um, overt uh, sexual uh, harassment, but, but it, it, it was a constant sort of sense that you didn't really belong to the enterprise. And that was well described in that study. And so it's really important to us as we're moving out that we are ensuring that harassment is um, rooted out, be it for gender or be it for any other reason. I mean, that's got to apply across the board. So all kinds of ways of trying to keep that curbed is, is very important and a priority for us. Um, and then bottom line is it's very competitive to attract the best talent to any endeavor. We want to be sure that we've got a really good polar research and policy uh, and research support community. It's competitive. We know in the US we have a shortage of STEM qualified talent. And so if we don't pay good attention to being inclusive and tapping the demographics that have not been tapped appropriately, we're gonna lose out. So that's just a pragmatic bottom line and, and we need to push in that direction. Perhaps uh, some of you may be familiar with the fact that our demographics are shifting quite dramatically in the US. As of 2016, in the age zero to 17 um, group, we have reached the point where it was uh, uh, minority majority is what we say, but there were uh, as many non-white uh, people in that age group in the US as, as white. And that is um, propagating through our uh, projections for population and somewhere in 2050 or so, we would expect that to be true for the general population. Um, we do know that there are um, some really good ways of uh, ensuring success in, in these groups, the minority groups. And we have what we call minority serving institutions in our country, they actually, um, service up to 30% of the populations we're talking about. And they're more successful than the general um, institutions. So we have, again, another academy study that's looked very carefully at that. And what is it that they do that makes it better for those people in that community to thrive, to pick the careers they want to pursue and to thrive in them. So we're looking very carefully at all of that and seeing where we can pull that into the polar world. Uh, help engage those institutions and use the things those institutions do well to, to help ourselves going forward. And finally, I should just say, you know, it's also our priority to remain engaged with uh, organizations that support groups of people. I think as Ravi was saying earlier, you tend to want to identify with your tribe. If you want to stick with something, it helps to have a tribe or it helps to have a, a support group. So I think it's critically important that we remain engaged uh, with groups like APEX and um, some of the minority serving groups in, in the US and so forth. Oh, that's fantastic, Kelly, thank you. Yes, that the key elements of, of both attraction and retention. 
are very important as we strive to improve our diversity. Ravi, can you tell us uh, what you, what sort of future you would like to see and what sort of change you might like to see with diversity and inclusion? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, India is a country of uh, diversity. We have uh, different languages, some of the most deeply religious societies and cultures, not to mention sexual orientations of the people living here. And there are definitely inequality in many areas. While there are efforts in place to bring in equality, slowly things are evolving, but definitely it is taking some time to bring equality. We need to accelerate this process by some innovative way. Of course, our government has started to provide some reservation to underrepresented people to get more diverse people in every field, including polar research. We encourage and facilitate and also motivate our scientists as well as students and all the researchers to continue their work in different field. And year by year, I think we are seeing the change. The trends are increasing. Maybe five years back, you cannot see no Indian woman in Antarctica. But at least now I can say proudly, at least tremendous number of uh, people have increased. So that is some change. And also uh, government is trying in science and technology in STEM uh, leadership, they are definitely they are considering more and more in uh, what is called underrepresented people to lead the organization. So that is a welcome change from the government side. From our institute point of view, actually though there are uh, 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 separate fellowships and scholarship for marginalized group by science and technology and still there is a diversity is low. Maybe we should do more awareness campaign to attract more diverse group in polar research. Still, we need to do uh, more and more, especially I'm thinking about the underrepresented people to call them and give some outreach program, especially students, young students and other people so that they get motivated and they feel that yes, they are also in the game. And maybe we can also think of uh, uh, some of the thought processes going on, whether it is possible to gender responsive budgeting, whether it can do, do that. And also we need to change the support structure to build the better environment, especially for underrepresented to undertake polar research and safe and inclusive environment in the office as well as in the field for all communities essential that we have to enhance that one. So need to educate and communicate at all levels via social media, blogs or newsletters, or web pages or whatever may be the case so that we can include this different uh, uh, community come together. They feel for it and so that they can come together for the uh, increasing the diversity number. Thank you. Thank you. Ravi, another two key words, educate and communicate. Thank you very much. Jane, would you like to uh, tell us what you believe the, the, you would like out of the future with the improvement in diversity and inclusion? Uh, yes, I think probably my other panellists um, uh, have covered quite a lot of this. Uh, <laughs> But I think, um, I suppose I would probably add to it that one of the things that we've been trying to do through the diversity and polar science initiative is to try and identify role models. Uh, I think, you know, we need to, we need to sort of address it from top down and bottom up. Uh, and so what's easier for us as leaders uh, is to basically, uh, as Kelly uh, articulately put, is to root out uh, discrimination where we find it and call it out and deal with it. Um, but equally we need, uh, uh, the groups that you've all been talking about to tell us what sort of issues people are encountering because um, if we're not aware of the of the barriers then we can't really address them so uh, I think having role models of people that have navigated their way through and can show a pathway will be really important we've been trying to identify role models uh, in our project and struggling uh, to find uh, that many uh, kind of non-white faces in the UK um, but seeking to do that uh, to demonstrate positive um, leadership, um, but also to, to, yeah, to where we do find those barriers is to try and break them down. We've been identifying 
some issues in the way that science funding is, is granted that has a very clear bias towards people that come from an extremely affluent background in the UK. Um, so there's a sort of an inherent uh, inequality from the outset. So um, there's, a, there's a challenging for polar science in that the, the kind of the, the pond that we're fishing in, uh, which is the STEM pond, largely for polar science, is, is already not particularly diverse. And then you add on polar and the kind of, you know, the, the way people perceive polar, um, it kind of adds an even greater challenge. So one of the reasons that we, we kind of gave birth to our diversity initiative was very much thinking about this being the 200th anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica. Uh, and for most part of the next 150 years, the only people that recorded uh, that went there were white men. Everyone else was sort of, you know, written out of history. Uh, and that really for the future of polar science uh, and polar um, protection and understanding, uh, we have to get a full diversity. There has to be an international commitment of understanding what Antarctica means to everyone to make everybody engage with it, to fund the science, to properly understand it, and then to subsequently manage it in an effective way. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jane. Oh, I think I'll stay with you though and follow on from that. Um, I think everyone on the call understands that the Arctic and Antarctic are special places scientifically, culturally, and globally at the moment. What do you think that element adds to the difficulty regarding diversity and inclusion, but also why do you think it's important to make sure we get that inclusion? Um, I'm not sure really. I'm not, I'm not sure kind of what, what the particular factors are. I mean, other than the kind of historical um, position and of course the, the historical position is not that historical. I mean, if you were a British woman, you weren't allowed to overwinter until the 1990s. Um, so it's it's uh, it's fairly um, it's fairly modern uh, changes. So I think the acceleration of change is, is coming quite rapidly. Um, so yeah, kind of working out really what that what those barriers are is one of the things that we're we're looking at. That's true. Kelly, do you have a, a, an idea about um, some of the difficulties because it is the polar regions? I sure do. <laughs> um, having, having worked there uh, through my career, uh, particularly starting in the Arctic, um, I think, you know, when I started, we, the, generally the world has been thinking of polar regions as remote places that are reserved for the truly adventurous that aren't particularly connected to our day-to-day -day life. Um, more of the place of imagination. But that's changed dramatically. Uh, that really has changed dramatically. I think the International Polar Year helped. The fact that it's so central to our climate system has helped and that, you know, the youth climate movement in general and bringing all of that information to the broader global public has really changed the perception. Um, I do believe when I got started that I, I remember thinking I should just get a beard because they're not listening to me, but it, they seem to only be listening to people with beards. No offense, Marcelo. Um, so, but I, but I do think that that has even been, you know, changing. I, I would like to say that we were successful during the IPY in getting off the ground with a notion that um, humanity has come to realize and appreciate just how interconnected our planet is and um, the importance of polar regions for all, no matter where you live, it's not disconnected. So we really need all hands on deck in order to deal with the, with the problems of research that are really pressing in polar regions. Um, and you know, to understand the implications for life everywhere on the planet. So, um, and we all need a vested stake in that. I, I appreciated the comments made earlier about it's not just the people participating, it's the appreciation of the entire public that supports the whole enterprise that we need to engender. But we're not gonna do that if we don't engage broadly and we don't make every group uh, have a vested stake in it. So I, so I think uh, those are the things that are changing dramatically right now. And there is a certain kind of momentum toward inclusivity that we really do need to take full advantage of. Thank you very much. Ravi, do you think there's a particular um, 
area of, of, of difficulty because it is work in the Antarctic from, from India? When compared to difficulty, I feel that uh, people uh, like uh, they have inhibition as well as uh, they feel that, uh, of course, it is a conservative people uh, think that uh, maybe we will not able to go like that initially. But more and more, if it, people comes, then they will be able to do, they will be able to tell, they will be able to propagate, uh, it is easy and everything, it's fine like that. Because the initial, always initial torque is very high, so which we have to roll down. So I think it has been rolled now, and slowly I think people start coming up in the field to uh, this Antarctica, uh, polar research. Thank you. Marcelo, the link with Chile and uh, Antarctic science, do you think um, there is there's a special uh, need for to make sure we do have diversity and inclusion in, in the polar sciences? Yes, of course, we have a lot to do. The, the thing is that it's evolving um, in a faster way than our institutions and structures are evolving. Uh, that's the reason why we are trying to promote the, the creation of these tables of discussion uh, at the moment, because we, we need the, 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 the field of uh, all the information that exactly we need um, to redesign our national program every five years. And this year we have an, a special chapter about inclusion and, uh, and the possibility to create another instruments uh, to, to promote the inclusion. But uh, I have to say that I am, I'm really happy uh, the, the, the evolution that I, I saw in, in the last, during the last 20 years and uh, uh, with my first expedition to Antarctica and uh, see the, the, the fantastic effort of the first women that I saw diving in Antarctica and, and trying to deal with the equipment that was designed only for men and the way that we are conducting the things today is, is, a, is, a, is a universe of distance in between both dots and uh, but uh, we are listening uh, louder the voices of the young people that want to also find instruments to promote science in Antarctica, not competing with the, uh, the big uh, scientists, senior scientists that uh, uh, have this prestige to, to have uh, always uh, one uh, seat reserved in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in polar science. And um, of course, another, a, a long list of, of another uh, things that we have to deal with. Uh, the things are evolving quickly, and but I, I found that probably science and technology will will help to design a better way to solve these issues. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got about five minutes left of our panel before Renuka is going to wrap up for us for the session. I was just wondering if you would each have an idea of how we 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 have the example in front of us of how international and how very global the science regarding the polar regions is. How could our large global organizations, international groups, be sharing diversity and inclusion better so that we can use each other's in improvements as a platform instead of everyone having to reinvent the wheel? Ravi, can we start with you? I think the only way is, according to me, is the communication. I think we can start with uh, maybe social media or whatever the way. Maybe we can start slogan like diversity matters in Antarctica or something like that. So that to join the group, pull the uh, people and get the momentum so that we can have more uh, attention to more people so that more people involved in this uh, uh, action. So that's what we feel. Thank you. Jane, do you have an idea of how we can and, uh, help uh, incremental change? Yeah, well, I like Ravi's idea. We're, we're trying to start the hashtag diversity in polar science, um, but any others will will do. Uh, I think um, encouraging more leaders to, to be more visible about diversity. We just um, uh, launched our website today, which has got blogs from various senior leaders in the British Antarctic survey about um, their allyship. Um, we're also hoping to uh, try to get international enthusiasm for polar pride. 
Um, we thought about taking that to the Antarctic Treaty meeting, but we don't make these things uh, political because that will be challenging, but to get the kind of grassroots engagement in joint activity, um, then that would be uh, on, the, on the 18th of November, which fits into the LGBTQ plus uh, STEM day. Uh, so hopefully the polar part of that would be a spin-off and, and maybe get engagement across the, the world, but also supporting uh, women in polar science and minorities in polar science and polar pride uh, to get those kind of, uh, um, I think Kelly called them the tribes, I like that, the kind of to support, making sure that we're supporting the tribes, but also uh, um, demonstrating that, that uh, we all recognize and, and support, support and promote that in the, in the wider community. So uh, yeah, I think I said it before, top down and bottom up. Excellent, thank you very much. There's certainly plenty going on. Marcelo, how, how can we globally uh, attack this together? Sorry, you're just not unmuted there, Marcelo. <laughs> Sorry. Just in the, exactly in the same way that Jane mentioned that, um, Probably one important thing is trying to pay attention to what is happening in other communities, uh, groups, and um, we have an, a special advice board that is called COSOC. It is a civilian representatives committee, uh, and is by law is supervising uh, all the activities of INACH and, and giving some advice in in, in, a, in, a, in a local context could be key to connect these uh, organizations in between in uh, an international way uh, and exactly in the same way that is happening in science when there is a peer review uh, in between international specialists was promoted in order to avoid duplication of efforts could be key to 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 know what uh, efforts are happening in other countries and nations communities and uh, small groups to answer to these questions because uh, of course the, the time is uh, is key to to answer that the, the the social movements are evolving more quickly that uh, we can expect and we need the uh, um, quick answers uh, so we, we are we want to push this uh, second level of cooperation thank you sounds like a great idea thank you very much kelly would you like to finish off and tell us how we can utilize all this energy that is happening around the world and make sure that we're making the most of it? First of all, I wanna thank you and Renuka and all of the organizers of this session at SCAR for um, you know, evolving the focus you had on gender issues at the previous SCAR to, to this topic. And I think you, you've provided an excellent model. It's a, it's a natural progression, but in, and I, I wanna say that in ComNAP, uh, at our last AGM and, and one previous to that, we did focus on the gender and gender harassment issues and things like that. I was very um, surprised to learn just how much enthusiasm there was internationally for tackling those issues. It was extremely good productive discussion. So keeping those discussions going is absolutely critical going forward. And it can't be just discussion. I think that's basically your point. And, and so, you know, sharing best practices um, and, and pra pragmatic information in those venues and, and elsewhere. I know, you know, at the National Science Foundation, we have best practices with respect to um, minimizing harassment in field science. We have a website dedicated to that and uh, that continually gets updated. But I think, again, we're gonna be evolving our National Science Foundation site to, to in, embrace this, this whole topic. It, it, writ large, not just gender based. But um, so, so I think there, there are lots of good ways and I really applaud SCAR for keeping things going and we will keep them going um, in the ComNAP. And um, hopefully as we keep them going, we're educating us all. The community really needs to do the hard work. I think the language I'm hearing in this group is appreciated by us and the group that organized this, but isn't broadly appreciated. So when you say things like intersectionality and stuff, people don't know what that means yet, but we do need to keep pushing hard to get people wrapped into understanding of what the issues are. So 
work ahead is, is, uh, is needed. Excellent. Thank you very much. I would like to sincerely thank our four panelists for joining us today. Uh, your comments were uh, it definitely is about leadership. It's about the inclusion and diversity leadership we need in polar science. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank SCAR for hosting this session and also to my uh, fellow conveners. Their work they have done to pull this together has been extraordinary. Um, I think we'll leave with some of the key words about education, communication, retention and attraction. So thank you so much, everyone. And Renuka, I'll hand over to you. Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, Donna, uh, and all of the participants from the leadership panel. That was an amazing discussion, uh, not just in this panel, but throughout the session. On behalf of all of the co-organizers, I have the great honor of doing the round of thanks to all of my co-organizers, all the panelists, and all of you, the audience. I convey my heartfelt thank you for participating in this session. I hope you have enjoyed the discussions and I've been left with some food for thought from all of the discussions today. If you haven't, I'm going to give you some points now. Um, some of the points that I noted down, which I think we need to underline and kind of continue thinking about. The new normal post COVID needs to be a more equitable and inclusive normal. We have been give, given a, a chance to change aspects of polar science. And we need to ensure that we grab this chance with both hands and ensure that we work towards making the world a more equitable and normal, um, inclusive place. We have to break down some of the systematic barriers, systemic barriers that exist. Breaking these barriers down will only give you the best scientists in order to do the best science in the polar regions. We have to understand the importance of networks and the support that is provided by them, and we have to continue to support them. We have to keep the discussions going both top down and bottom up directions, as we have seen in a lot of the points raised today, that both of these are equally important. We really need to move away from the just deal with it mentality. Um, we need to recognize the fact that when people bring out diversity issues, when they bring up diversity issues in conversation, we not label them as troublemakers. We listen to them and we open our minds when people are speaking to us. When I last closed the session on diversity in Polar 2018 in Davos, I had promised that we will continue to work on highlighting all of the underrepresented minorities and not just women. Well, I think today I can say that I have kept my promise with the help of all of my co-organizers and I underline the need for keeping this momentum going. Let us keep lifting those around us that need it. Thank you very much and I wish you a happy afternoon, evening or morning wherever you are. Thank you.